You know what my favorite thing about you is, Christine? Today, right now. Okay, I'll just tell you. I was waiting for a, what, Em? Tell me, I gotta know. Uh, hello? Hello? Em, you froze that whole time. I, you said, I'm going to say something nice, and then it just completely went, and the computer said, no, actually. It's as if maybe I shouldn't say anything, so... I, I just know that it was recording locally on your end, so whatever you did say, the rest of the world heard, but apparently it was not for my ears. Um, oh, no. I said uh, I said I wanted to compliment you, and then I waited for a long time for you to seem excited, and you didn't, so I was like, well, I guess maybe I just won't do it then. I probably seemed afraid, because the whole you screen did. went... <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's try again. You want to know something nice about you, Christine? I mean, I'm afraid now, but yeah, I would love to. Please, please. I love this new segment you've created at the start of our show. Go ahead. Well, one, your skin looks incredible. But ah! two, my other thing was actually that I love that when on your screen where it says your name and your pronouns, I like that she, her sounds like she, fur. I feel like you've probably gotten that before. Okay. But you've brought this up before on the show. Have I? It yeah. really gets me tickled every time. Okay. So we, and then I got in a lot of trouble. Okay. Why? Because last time you brought it up, I made kind of a flippant remark because somebody had written in that they were kind of upset about. Because we, on Beach to Sandy, we used to say she, her, she, fur. Like that was kind of the joke. Like I she do remember slash this her slash she, fur. Remember that mm -hmm. time I cried in the green room on tour? Um, that which, was. Which time? <laughs> 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 the time where I came in and I just burst into tears and everyone was like, what the hell is wrong with you? And I said, it's my turn to cry because everybody else had already cried. Um, that was because somebody wrote in um, and was very kind of upset that I had sort of made a flippant remark on And That's Why You Drink about how somebody had written in saying they were uncomfortable with the use of she, her, she, for. And then... Wow. Um, I don't know. They said that we're making okay. light of pronouns. I'm not really sure, but they, again, I hear I go making flip. I'm not trying to make a flippant remark. So we stopped doing it on Beach to Sandy. Okay. We completely okay. stopped it. So we don't want to hurt anyone or upset anyone, even though it was really one of my favorite things. And we did have like, I like a little it. pin design it feels, for it. But I like it, especially because both of our names rhyme with it. Because she, for she, her, and M, they, them. Wait a minute. But apparently that's flippant. I don't know. It feels like we're just yeah. like making it very clear where we stand. I feel like some people have been upset with like me discussing pronouns because they say that I'm kind of, uh, so we just got, an, Alexander and I just got another email of somebody who was upset that like, I guess this is why I drink because we did get an email saying that they were upset that we got confused when my brother was talking about, he said something like, oh, they. And I thought he meant like a group, like a two people that were in this review, and he mm -hmm. meant they as a as a singular pronoun. And they were like, "You're contributing to the confusion around." And I'm like, honestly, I think just oh, talking, God. just talking about using they them pronouns as a normal pronoun, everyday pronoun, is not. I don't think it's belittling I mean, maybe... pronouns. I don't know. I just feel like why not make it a lighthearted, like fun to talk about, like normal thing to discuss instead of like tiptoeing around it on eggshells, right? Like I just don't also, understand. I feel like as the they them in the room, let me make right. it clear that when words there when words are homophobes, you get you get confused sometimes yeah it's exactly just and it, language it to be honest it was like part of the joke like you know we weren't whatever long story short people canceled upset about <laughs> my use of pronouns in a in a light-hearted way but i feel like that's kind of a good i mean I, just correct me if i'm wrong but i feel like discussing pronouns like as if it was any other aspect of a personality or a, or identity is not belittling them like i feel like pronouns are so important to discuss and i don't want to tiptoe around them like they're sacred you know like yeah i feel like at this point people it. if people don't know where you stand i i, I don't know what to tell you i don't yeah. know so I, I would like to think that one day in a in a perfect world i can make fun of we can make fun of each other's pronouns the way we make fun of each other's names where it's like we're right, not invalidating right, right. the fact that they exist yeah. it's just yes. like 
if a joke and, comes around and it's like not harmful why not right and i want to be Whatever. clear here too like if people are listening my brother does not listen to this podcast so like please don't go yell at him this is me if you if this is upsetting you like if you're if it, you feel like i'm not calling anyone out i'm not trying to call anyone out i'm not trying to invalidate that anyone was upset or hurt or what have you i really am not um but i just i thought i'd share my experience with the she her she fur and why we don't really talk about it on beachy sandy but I do. I was very tickled when I found out when I it occurred to me that she, her, she for kind of rhymes and m they them rhymes. That's fun. I think it's fun. I don't know. I know I don't speak for all people, but speaking for myself, it is fine. But I mean, whatever. you are I the mean, empire, so you kind of do speak for everyone. You know what? You said it, not me. Okay. So, <laughs> wow. Sorry for really just enforcing know, a reason why you drink. That's and it's probably like, why my computer froze. It was like, you actually don't want to be part of this conversation because uh, you're going to get That was God's canceled. last try to keep you from bringing it up. Um, <laughs> no, I'm like, I, I've tried so actively. I don't try to not get canceled. I, I like to think I don't have to try that hard. But, you know, I, I try to be like as cognizant of people's uh, feelings. But, you know, every now and then things still slip through the cracks. So I apologize uh, if I've... I guess uh, so offended anybody i really it's really i promise you not my intention um anyway so em now that you know why i drink why do you drink <laughs> <laughs> oh why well, I, I guess i i feel bad that i caused that whole kerfuffle no uh, i'm glad i'm time, glad you but... opened opened a door for me to talk about it briefly i opened a big queer door for mm-hmm. you um i drink man i'm just so sleepy christine i've my sleep my sleep is just even worse than normal. Um, and that's so, not, that's actually, I feel like now we're in the red zone. I feel like you <laughs> exist know. in a permanent sleep state of like orange threat level. And now we're like, uh oh, uh oh, danger. Like I, I'm like kind of in, um, I'm in like a, a nodding situation. So I was like, oh good, I'll be slap happy. Maybe this will lead to some good conversation. Maybe it'll lead to some bad conversation. Are you but... going to fall asleep like I did on the show? You know what? I'm owed one, so I actually feel less bad now. Um. Well, I mean, to be honest, it's like shocking that I fell asleep once and you didn't. You fall asleep so That's easily. So true. Yeah, right. I'm, like, so much, a... I'm so much better at this than you. You are. Um. <laughs> you really are. It's true. Oh no, you. You know what? That does make me feel better. That if I were to doze, <laughs> you know, I've got a, I've got a pass, a hall pass. So. You do. You have a hall pass, but only one. But only one. Yeah, I can't mess it up. It has to be really worth it. So I'm not yeah. going to do it today. But um, uh, where? What? Yeah, I think that's. I don't really have a reason. I why thought I you drink. were about to say where am I, and I was like, okay, you need to use your pa- <laughs> you need to use your hall pass today. Go to bed. <laughs> I yeah no I I luckily know where I am physically well, that's mentally good. absolutely not. <laughs> um yeah no I'm 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 okay other than being sleepy if i took a really good nap right now i'd be a 10 out of 10 so we're gonna we're just gonna rock with that instead if my biggest... we're gonna work how does that sound we you know i'm so <laughs> lucky that my job is like the worst thing about my job is like one of the is that you can't best things you can do yeah, yeah 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 it's like the worst part of my job is i get to hang out with like a best friend and like talk yeah. about things we enjoy it's kind of wild it's like pretty good the life. worst part of the job is that we can't just sleep the whole time but well, you know that's you any job it, sister right <laughs> 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 but the rest of the job is fucking a-okay a-okay yeah i'm feeling good um so i uh what was i gonna say i don't remember oh, it's gonna be a lot of prob- that today good luck prob- <laughs> probably a story i think you were gonna say but i mean what do i know i do have a story i well so i have um I guess something to talk about. I don't know if it's actually a story. It's kind of, it's not even really a one-on-one. This was in me being already so sleepy. I decided that these uh-huh. would be the notes. And so I went a little Is it like today. Your, your receipt from the dot, like your health insurance paperwork or something. You're like, I just decided <laughs> these are my notes for today. I just looked around and said, this I'm is I'm actually it. just going to recite my medications for you. Honestly, um, that could probably fill an hour for both of us. Yeah. No, I I went off a little, uh, I don't know, off the deep end and decided, oh, I'm going to cover this. And it's not paranormal, but it is dark and grisly, which I hope still fits people's, uh, fills your desire of the macabre. Oh, wow. Wow. All right. (laughs) Yeah. Just get ready. Just enjoy. That's all I got to say. Um. 
I'm going to tell you uh, some fun facts. The whole thing is basically fun facts. I love that. We know. We all know we love that. We all know you love that, and you know we love that. It doesn't even matter what anyone loves. It's what I love. Oh. And I <laughs> okay. love You're a like, fun honestly, fact. thank and you for I your love... input, but irrelevant. So let's get back to this. You know, we've, we've done enough of these. It's time that we're just honest with ourselves. Okay. All um, right. Fine. It's not about us. Okay. I get it. Okay. I decided I was inspired by our last episode where I mentioned Mary had a little lamb. Oh, fun. Uh, where that was actually a fun fact from a previous episode. Right. So now that fun fact has inspired these. What fun a fun facts, chain of events, which are. Isn't it? Yeah. So I'm going to talk about the dark side of nursery rhymes. Yeah. Oh shit. This is my German self is tingling. So I want it because of that. I wanted to make a caveat early on that I'm not going to be discussing anything that starts from like the Grimm brothers. Like this, it's not, um, stories or songs because or it's i guess some of them are songs because they're nursery rhymes but um i had to like figure out which ones to cover and which ones to not because like entire phds on like one fairy tale from the brothers Grimm. so yeah i can understand why it would be maybe not the best idea to go broad on this one yes also thank you for saying brothers Grimm. i said Grimm brothers i was gonna coast but then you um Anyway, so these are the like sing songy two three liners that Love we it. like playground chants, as you will. <gasps> um, and so I wanted to because if you look at like even like we just talked about with Brothers Grimm, those stories are like fucked up. Like all of these have horrible origins. <laughs> so um, we're just sticking with nur- nursery rhymes today. So uh, start with a fun fact, real quick. Do you know when nursery rhymes began? Hmm. when rhyming began i don't know that's probably actually the right answer it's like a trick um, answer <laughs> it kind of is because i feel like as long as oral traditions have existed right. it's probably a trick question but um officially nursery rhymes began in the 14th century where they were like oh, meant okay. for children and they were limericks to help with m- cognitive development and I terror guess. and um, mental mental and terror uh mental never illness. forget yep anguish anguish yes uh they started in the 14th century but i guess they weren't like really a thing until the 18th century which is considered the golden age of nursery rhymes oh by the way. Who, who knew <laughs> which i guess since i mean you haven't really heard of a new nursery rhyme recently they don't like come out with new ones anymore so they all come from that's true that, i think that era and just keep telephoning i was gonna say new, even the new, new ones now, are based on the like traditional then. ones like even the new like more modern ones are usually like a play on the the original so yeah that makes sense yeah so it makes sense also then why a lot of our nursery rhymes today are so fucked up because they are from a time when these things maybe weren't seen as so fucked up i guess right sure so anyway, fun fact, they come from the 18th century, most of them. The first nursery rhyme collection was from a book called Tommy <laughs> Thumb's Songbook. And it comes from 1744. That was the first like booklet of rhymes. And quick shout out to nursery rhymes, despite their content. They are very helpful with uh, young development. They help kids learn vocabulary rhyming spatial reasoning rhythm structure grammar it helps you sound out words it helps you memorize stories before you can read and according to uh, one person in child development if you teach a kid eight eight nursery rhymes every year then they will like if there's some like wild percentage jump in their reading comprehension mm. when they're older because they have like a they have a bigger right. toolbox to work from of, of words and vocabulary and rhythm and all that. So that makes sense. So fun fact, teach Leona at least eight of these. I'm good Got enough, it? right? Like, can I just take a minute break for a minute? I don't need to do teaching her more anything. She's teaching enough. She's learning enough. You know, with how dark a lot of these nursery rhymes are, maybe instead of teaching her eight of those, she just listens to eight of our episodes and it'll be exactly the same oh, in terms perfect of Perfect idea, trauma. especially because they're many so, hours long. I, You know, she's already memorized uh, Mothman ABCs, the book, so I feel like... Precious. I feel like that's enough. That's 26 letters. If someone can make our podcast rhyme, 
I can. Shall we even start rhyming? Oh. I'm not on the fly. I'm too tired for that. But it, it, it give me like uh, another day. And absolutely. I was going to rhyme with your last word, but then you kept adding more words. And I was like, you know what, Em? You're making this really difficult. And <laughs> I feel like I want to make it rhyme, but you're not giving me the time. So next time I'll try when I say bye-bye. <laughs> it doesn't even make any sense. <laughs> You know what? That's the closest thing to poetry. I've read a lot of nursery rhymes today, oh. and that's the best one I've heard so far. And it had the Honestly, least. Honestly, that's probably where I go. It, where too, I go right? It's like I don't talk about. Like I leave the dark shit for my actual episode, not for the fun rhyming portion of the episode. Well, one of my favorite things I stumbled upon, which I forgot the. I I I don't know who to give credit to. There was. I'll it's one it. of the websites I have in at the bottom, so I don't know who to shout out. It was probably Mental Floss, because that was where I got a lot of my information. But somebody wrote a nursery rhyme today about something fucked up to give you an idea of how it might have sounded when it first came out in the 18th century. Oh, that's genius! And so they were like, if a nursery rhyme with this level of dark (gasps) content existed today, this is how uncomfortable it should sound for us. But imagine children just like singing it and dancing on a playground. Jeff, the chef, loved his fresh guests. He invited them in and they all lost their heads. Jeff, the chef, didn't have enough beds, so he had to make room in all his ice chests. And apparently that's about Jeffrey Dahmer. I see. Yeah. Okay. I get it now. Yeah. It's like, oh, that could be (laughs) Uh catchy. And then you don't really think about it. It just sounds a little off. And then when you get older, you're like, wait a minute. Someone should do like a dissertation, like a psychology dissertation on how effective rhyming is immediately when it comes to dissociating from oh as, like, the, as the a harsh big fan of limericks i can tell you it, there's a strong correlation <laughs> i can promise you that yeah <laughs> that's what i'm saying you could talk about anything and as long as it's rhyming you f- feel it's almost 50% like better oh about the harsh truths of the world are softened the blow is softened yeah uh-huh yeah yeah, yeah. anyway enough people eventually did realize how dark some of the tones were in these nursery rhymes and they founded the british society for nursery rhyme reform whoa and because most of the uh nursery rhymes are from england Mm -hmm. so i guess that's they looked at their own list of nursery rhymes and went wait a tick what have we done They decided to clean up a bunch of their rhymes, and by 1941, the society had condemned a hundred of their own nursery rhymes for referencing, quote, poverty, scorning prayer, ridiculing the blind, plus 21 cases of death, 12 of animal torment, and one case each of consuming human flesh, body snatching, and the desire to have one's own limbs severed. To have one. Okay. This is. Okay. And that was in 19... 19- that was 1941. So, like, imagine so those were what all condemned. condemned. Those were all condemned. Imagine that's that's bananagrams. Okay, wow. I have to be honest. I did look for the poem about desiring to have your own limbs I mean, severed. Didn't find it. But I did want is basically to know. he carries. I mean, it's not desiring, but he carries around big scissors so he can cut your thumb off. So I guess that's close. Same difference. I mean, the only. The only difference between a cautionary tale and a nursery rhyme is one sh- shorter and sing song. I feel like the Germans were like, we're not going to make this fun and rhyming and easy for children. We're going to make this as traumatic and blatantly upsetting as possible. And they did it. I feel like the Germans said, here's Stroll Peter. And then the Brits were like, um, let's sing about it instead. So no one notices. But like, we still have to talk about it for some reason. Like, and s- instead of just <laughs> we'll being do normal like a- around our children. <laughs> It's like a bing, bang, bong. Like what mm-hmm. you heard over there. Let's let's just get to the quick bullet point and we'll sing about it. And Pick then up a jump no rope one will and really no one will even happened. think twice. You know, if you're jump roping, you're not paying attention <laughs> to the to the lyrics. Mm-mm. No, not at all. <laughs> so here are a few um, quick ones that I'll read to you. Just to, like the fact that we sang them and it, or even like you know, hummed them together, chanted them together. I don't know what the right word is, but. We said them on the playground. It didn't even affect us. Corner there was chanting them. An old lady. And everyone else was like, can you stop and like play jump rope? And I was like, I feel like you were chanting my nursery rhyme. <laughs> I feel like you were chanting them backwards Yeah, I was or adding something. Latin <laughs> phrases. It was like, where did you come up with that? <laughs> Your eyes actually went pure black. <laughs> uh, so 
This is uh, just a quick example. One is there was an old lady who swallowed a fly. And the the line is, I don't know why she swallowed a fly. Perhaps she'll die. And- <laughs> you know what? And I love that nursery <laughs> rhyme. I don't know. That's, yeah. Did you like where it said, there was an old lady who swallowed a horse? She's dead, of course. Yeah, because I thought, that's fun. It rhymes. <laughs> but you know what? Like, part of me feels like I thought about it so literally where I was like, of course she's dead. She swallowed a fucking horse. Like, she wouldn't survive that. She would not survive. Why would you do that? Yeah. Yeah. And I thought about it so literally I wasn't even thinking about, like, the why am I being taught this? Um, yeah, same. Also, uh, Tom Tom the Piper's son. Do you know this one? I don't. It's uh, Tom Tom the Piper's son stole a pig and away he run. The pig was eat, but Tom was beat and Tom ran Woof, crying down the street. Okay. So immediately I I feel like I'm trying to channel like my grandpa of like back in the day it didn't mean anything. Because like I feel like this was a cautionary right. tale about like don't steal or like you have yeah, earned right, the right, right to right, get right. I mean I don't think that long ago something. that would have been an upsetting concept. It, yeah, exactly. Um, there's also... This one was just, I don't know who this was warning. It only just instilled a fear of birds. But in Sing a Song of Sixpence, there is a phrase, the maid in the garden was hanging out clothes and down came a blackbird who pecked off her nose. Oh my God. (laughs) So I feel like that actually deters children from doing chores. It's like, well, I'm not going outside. I mean, yeah, that's a little, seems a little backward. Did you know this one or the one before the Tom Tom one? Before this episode? No, me neither. I didn't know those, but, uh, they were quick one-liners. One that we both do know, though, is it's raining, it's pouring. Oh, Leona saying that yesterday. Which, what's what's? Maybe she does know more than I thought. Maybe she is a great uh, reader, or whatever you said earlier. Um, if she comes up to you after the fact and says, "Mommy, why did he have a concussion and die in his sleep?" True, he never woke you, up. That's right. Of course, I know that. Yeah, he went to bed, bumped his head, and couldn't get up in the morning. Ooh. Which I guess could have just sounded like he had a headache and he just didn't want to get out of bed. And I'm not quite dead yet, you know. But like, and like, bumped his head implies that he didn't crack his fucking head against the headboard. It's not a Humpty Dumpty situation. But like, it's, but yeah, went to bed, bumped his head hard enough he couldn't get up in the morning. That makes me seem, that makes it feel, I mean, unless it's, they're separate entities. He happened to bump his head, but he also happened to be really drunk. I from mean, the but night also before he's he was snoring. So it's up. like, okay, you that know? implies he's alive at least through part of the night, you know? Yeah. You know what? You're right. That one's fine. Okay. Let's keep it. Okay. <laughs> Leona, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> now, this one I don't know enough about. Only one source said this, and but apparently the song This Old Man mm. was warning children about creepy old men being inappropriate with them. Oh. Now, I will say the song is a little bananas, but kind of in a way where like I don't even know what I'm singing. Yeah, I just saw like, like, this he old played Knick Knack played... on, th- on his thumb or something. This old man, one, he played, played knick knack on four. My thumb. I don't know how the pa- knick knack, patty whack, give a dog a bone. This what? old man went rolling home. What the fuck is that supposed to mean? That honestly, all of these fucking cautionary, they're like, oh, well, don't steal a pig or you'll get beat. And then it's like, oh, but when we're talking about child predators, we're going to make it so obscure and convoluted that you'll never actually learn anything. You know, that's a great point. You know what I wonder though? And I didn't do enough research on this. I will own that. But I wonder if this old man is like written in Cockney because it's supposed to be like a coded language where like you don't would have would have understood that we don't anymore or like we don't in the U.S. Maybe. Let me see. Knickknack pirate. Give a dog a bone. Well, give a dog a a bone. Do we know what knickknack paddywhack means? Is that (laughs) knickknack (laughs) paddywhack? That's what it means, man. I don't know. This okay, old man let me look came rolling home. I mean, I know what a knickknack is. I got about a fucking thousand of those. You knick-knack, sure do. Patty whack. Knickknack patty whack. What does it mean? Uh, patties, as they were known in English, would sell knickknacks. According to the theory, this is from Lad Bible, so excuse me. <laughs> According to the. Th- <laughs> According to the theory, when they tried selling their items door to door, they'd be given a whack and sent on their way, while their dog would be given a bone, as in the song. So, oh, maybe like a creepy guy showing up at your door? Huh. I don't know. It was also only one source. I feel like maybe we were reaching there. Reach. Um, but it does know. sound like 
Sounds like a door door salesman just keeps getting rejected, but like everyone likes his dog, so the dog that gets doesn't treats. sound too bad. Let's keep that one. That I'm fine with. Yeah, and that sounds actually. I mean, I don't really like door door salesmen anyway, and I do it's like still dogs, actually so it still very relevant true. in today's society, especially as people hate people abruptly showing up at their home more and more. Readopting you know? this nursery rhyme. <laughs> Fully, give him a give the patty a whack and give the give dog a boat or give something. Do- just don't forget the dog. <laughs> <laughs> it's that god uh, dog. Tell the patty to get out of here. Roll on home. Okay, so <laughs> so uh, actually, you know that was one of my favorite ones when I was a little kid. Fun fact. <laughs> uh, yeah, he, Raffy he got really me good a few uh, times. revolutionized the whole nursery rhyme industry, as far as I'm concerned. With zero reference points for saying that. Uh, you have one reference right here. I don't know what you're talking about. A source Just told me. A source. And it may and have been mental no Foss, but it also may have been M. So <laughs> who knows? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's another one. This is where they do actually start to get dark. Those were some, like, silly ones. You know, ha ha ha, the man is abusing children. Ha ha ha. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, but here, here are some with some actual, like, okay. meteor backgrounds that i could find so baba black sheep I lo- we sing this every night Do you know this so one i'm already in trouble uh-oh excellent well apparently people well okay let me do this first this came out in 1731 a top charter billboard sure. number one for weeks i feel like in 1731 right you didn't have a lot of competition a lot of it I feel was like you like, just had to have access know, to write something play on the piano because or have a piano which like most people did not i feel like this one had this one right, had words. Right, right. That'll you do know? it. It's probably immediately Banger. Tony, Grammy. Tony. Yeah, 100%. All of it, yeah. He got, he got <laughs> award winner. Yep. He got we, all the way, Baba Black Sheep. So, uh, Baba Black Sheep, have you any wool? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Three bags full. Um, this is actually about, allegedly, sources say, this is about the great custom, which was a 13th century medieval wool tax. Oh, and in this tax, it was created by King Edward the First. He decided that for every sack of wool sold, if a farmer sold a sack of wool, only a third would get to go to oh, the farmer shit. in profit. The other two thirds went to oh, him and the church. Okay, I'm seeing. And so, in the original song, I don't know if these are the lyrics anymore, but in the original song, it was "Yes sir, yes sir, three bags full." Uh. One for my master, one for my dame. And I say one for Leona, who lives down the lane. Although maybe I should change that. I don't know yet. Precious. <laughs> well, so no, well, no, that, that, that part's not like too dark. It, it's the original lines were one for the shepherd boy crying down the oh, lane. Oh, geez. Okay. Yeah. No, we, I, we've and changed this, that, I think, in modern times. So he was originally crying because he sold wool and only got a third of the profit. <laughs> That's sad. <laughs> So that was sad. Plus, I guess um, black sheep compared to white sheep were they didn't sell as much because you couldn't dye their fleece. Oh. And so they already were oh. less money. OK, than, well, I, I think you'll sheep. appreciate our version, which is that we just keep singing it and we keep making. So we'll be like Blaze and I will take turns sometimes if we're like in a hotel and she wants one of us to sing and it'll go like Baba tie dye sheep. Have you any wool or like. Baba glow in the dark sheep we you know we change the color every time um so I'm glad that uh I don't have to cancel myself over that one you don't uh and but there have been people which I feel like this is where you sensed it might be going uh people have thought maybe there is an association with the fact that black is not as good as white and the freight the word master being in the song right that part's not great yeah um a lot of people have questioned if there's some racial messaging there um its official history is unknown we don't know if there's any actual you know meaning to that but uh, Mm. a lot of schools have banned the song from being quoted um or they have switched the word black to something else apparently a lot of them have switched to rainbow sheep oh that's one of my lines too Perfect. So you're right on right on top of it. Try tie-dye, guys. It's really fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, while we're here and while we're early in the episode is where I'm going to bring up like the actual Uh-oh. horrid shit just so we can then be a little more playful later, not end on mm. 
something so intense, but sure. it is also important to mention. So talking about Baba Black Sheep, that one, we don't know if it had any racial undertones to it, but there certainly are some. You don't that say. We just don't say anymore. Um, one of them, yeah. Eeny, Meeny, Miny, Mo. So for those who don't know, it used to not be a tiger you were catching by the toe, but a racial slur. Um, yep. And there are a bunch of variations on that song. They were all equally horrible. They were all using the racial slur. Um, but through and through, the song was openly, directly about catching enslaved Black people if they tried to run away. Oof. So we've changed the word to tiger, but, you know, historically, no, not good. Another one, which I feel uncomfortable even saying this, is Ten Little Monkeys, which oof, uh, oof, that uh. on its own is now an, another not good word, uh, just put in the place of a much worse word, uh, if we're comparing words, I guess. But uh, yeah, so that used to be a song, a rhyme, but it was from 1869, and it was originally not even that Ooh. phrase, Ten Little Blanks. It was... Ten little. I didn't lengths. know that. Um, it was very direct. Also, Agatha Christie wrote a book with the same title, um, which ended up getting renamed. But both of them, both the song and her book, were about ten different ways someone could die. The song specifically was ten different ways that little black children could die. <sighs> For God's sake! But it taught white uh, so... kids how to count. <laughs> so wow. that was what it was all about. Wow. Um, yuck. So it was heavily used in minstrel shows along with songs like Zippity Doodah, Turkey in a Straw, and Do Your Ears Hang Low. Wow, I'm learning, um, so I'm learning all of a those, lot because I feel like I sort of vaguely own. knew, like I've maybe seen some TikToks or listicles, but like it didn't really s stick. But now that you're saying them all together, it's like, oh, geez, yeah, there are a lot. There's a lot. There's also Oh Susanna, Jimmy Crack Corn, and Camptown Races, just as some of them. Um, there's another one I can't remember. Sorry on that or not really. I'm from Alabama um, with a banjo on my No, I just saw I'm a list. I sing it. <laughs> there's another one about s some someone in the kitchen with Dinah. That oh. one. I feel like that's I feel like that I don't know. I'm reading Strumming into everything all of a sudden, banjo. but I I'm scared of all of it. All I know is that Bugs Bunny was singing these by the way, like <laughs> so like this is just a reminder that, like, it's not like if you didn't hear, it's like some people didn't grow up hearing it. Like, very popular cartoons were singing it. It was it was a big time thing. So this is where I just do my PSA that nursery rhymes were not always mm. meant for everyone to enjoy. Um, not to scare anyone who's older than us who is just unpacking a lot of privilege, but... Uh, a lot of people say like, oh, well, there's just racism and everything. If you look hard enough, yes, um, yeah, including correct. nursery rhymes. Wow, you nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. Um, it was teaching white people all the way from early childhood before they could even read to sing about the suffering of black people. It was instilling in black children who heard this song that they should feel less than. Um, it was indoctrination at its finest, indoctrinating generations that have racist ideologies and not even know what they were singing about. Um, this is a quote, uh, from one of the sites I was looking at early on, children were being taught how to hate and how to engage with anti-black rhetoric. Hating black people was woven into their education and their play. And I just wanted Sorry to, to interrupt you, but like the no, fact no. that it's part of the play makes it so insidious because, or makes it so damaging because it's so insidious, like, you know, oh, it's just a silly playground rhyme. Well, that's an easy thing to sweep under the rug if you have that attitude. And so you can kind of just say, oh, you stop being a snowflake. It's just a rhyme, you know. Um, and so I feel or even I mean, people saying like, oh, it's just a joke. It's not a exactly. big deal. It's just a joke. It's the same or, idea. Oh, it's just a word. It's just a word in a song. What I can't sing about it. Literally with the nursery rhymes, I feel like there could even be like little five-year-olds being like oh i can't, can't even, even say jump it in a rope song. to it's it like, yeah, yeah exactly it's it just like... feels like of course it stuck around for so long because it's veiled in rhyme and fun little catchy sayings and then if you don't really look any deeper which why would a five-year-old look any deeper they don't know better it's just like of course that stuck around for so long it's that's very insidious well this is what we were saying too earlier about songs like if 
like how quickly you can dissociate from the meaning of something if it just rhymes and sounds fun. Because even as we're unpacking things actively, um, and I encourage all other white people to be doing the exact same thing, by the way, if you're not yet, but there are so many things that like we're actively mm -hmm. trying to unpack any privilege, any racism. And yet I'm telling you things right now mm -hmm. that like, I didn't know until I read this, you probably didn't know until I'm saying it. And it's like, it's just, there's always something new to learn. And the fact that these songs came out in like the 1800s, right at the crux of all of this. And then generationally was passed down because it's a fun song to teach a five-year-old. And then like Barney like, sang it, you know, it's like, wow, that is. Yeah. So it makes sense why it's still deeply rooted in society because even as we're trying to not be like the generations before us we're still singing songs to our kids not paying attention to the history it's, of a, it's so, exhausting and it's a lot of work but it is very important so i appreciate um you bringing this to the table just before your kid is singing a song that was rooted in a menstrual show you know before she can really sing you know <laughs> so i can kind of intervene if necessary so thank you for that <laughs> This is also where I shout out, um, I mentioned this in another episode a long time ago, but Turkey in the Straw, which is one of uh, the songs that is very deeply rooted in racism. Um, they ha That's like the mm. ice cream truck song that everyone knows. And right. a few years ago, they had um, black artists come in and create a new ice cream truck song. That's the coolest thing. And uh, I just wanted to give that a shout out again. So if you are driving past an ice cream truck and it sounds mm -hmm. different, they have updated their music. Um, anyway. Okay. So now we've talked about the important things. Now we can talk about the things that are um, not as horribly rooted in <laughs> societal collapse. Okay. So uh, let's talk about Goosey Goosey Gander. <laughs> Do you know about that? What? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so there's a uh this is a poem from 1784 and here's just one of the lyrics. I'll just leave leave this with you. There I met an old man who wouldn't say his prayers. So I took him by his left leg and threw him down the stairs. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> that is creative. <laughs> And children just sang oh. it and sang it and sang it. Um, apparently, this was the the theory is that this was about 16th century Catholic priests because during uh, a, a time where Protestants mm -hmm. kind of were taking over, it was illegal in some areas to be Catholic. You had to like say your prayers in secret, and so I guess the story was if you're Catholic, we'll throw you down the stairs. Um, but some folklorists have also said that even if it wasn't meant to be that, to, to be this new updated version, I guess the, it's not a new version lyrically, but instead of talking about Catholic priests, a lot of kids will talk about this while they're like playing with like <gasps> daddy long legs spiders. Because one of the lyrics is old father long legs can't say his prayers. Let him by the take him by the left leg and throw him down the stairs. Oh no! So are they hurting the spiders? So I know you are an animal activist, but I do know quite a large portion of children when we were kids who would just take legs off of Daddy Long Legs, just pull them off. You pull off the legs? I didn't fucking do it. I didn't want oh. to touch a spider. You said we, so I just want to make sure. Oh my god. We as a collective, I know. Oh my god! I think if a I saw very that, very large be... amount of children who did do this so i i know it was kind of common i i'm also just a humongous baby and i would just sit in the corner chanting in latin as we recall so maybe i just wasn't part of that group but yeah i remember i remember my memory of daddy long legs is that they were always like so scary because they're so big and then our teachers were like oh they're actually like really friendly and never harm you and if they're on you you can just blow on them and they'll go away so that was my memory of daddy long legs i did not know i didn't know about all this that's other precious shit. my memory is my memory is them being delimbed. Um, That's horrible. But you know what? It's just a, a way. Say it again. Say it double, a double, 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 double. Say it. Because, I mean, as we're singing about throwing people down the stairs, why wouldn't we be ripping people's legs off at the same time? Yeah, well, so true, true it point. Makes it sense makes perfect why sense. We were You're just right. raised to have no empathy. <laughs> just keep, keep, keep telling yourself that, everybody. Uh, and also, if you happen to be someone who used to rip legs off of spiders, 
for shame. I used to do fucked up shit. And I'm sure I, I told you guys I used to draw with the little red bugs, you know, so I, I to be honest, like I'm not I know it's sick, but Blech. I'm I'm I shouldn't even be shaming people. I'm sure I've done some fucked up shit with animal with like bugs and stuff. So I'm not trying to be I feel like I'm being hypocritical. So before anyone calls me out, but I feel like I would have been a kid who did that if I wasn't so scared of spiders, <laughs> but I was not interested yeah. in holding a spider to then rip it apart. Actively seeking that that experience out. Yeah. Right. Uh, anyway, so the not, not that I've heard this song before. I haven't heard Goose Goose Gander, but in the last time it was popular, I think people were singing it. And making it a daddy long leg song versus it being a Catholic 16th century <laughs> priest song. Wow, how charming. <laughs> so, old father long legs can't say his prayers. Take him by the left leg and throw him down the stairs. That's so great. Children were singing just, that. Just del- delightful. Also about Catholicism while living in Protestant England, there is the song Lady Bird, Lady Bird. Which goes, Lady Bird, Lady Bird, fly away from home. Your house is on fire and your children are gone. I thought I was going to say, and your children are home. Like they're going to burn to death, but I guess that's sort of implied. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, the, doesn't that make that actually probably good that they were missing? The house like, is burning down and your children are home. And I was like, oh, my God, somebody get the kids out. Well, oh, no, they're gone. Well, yeah. Because they were. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I, ga- I gathered. I okay. gathered that when you that said they're clicked. gone because it sounded so drastically sad. But I also thought, oh, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it meant also missing and I was like having a whole hoorah <laughs> over here. Okay. Lady bird, lady bird, fly away. Uh, fly away to home. Your house is on fire and your children are gone. All except one called Anne for she has crept under the frying Hello? pan. Like she survived because she hit. If I had to hide under a frying pan, I would you're be like one of our fingers Let's would survive or something. But like, how do you fit? Okay, I okay. Anyway, so that's the whole song, I think. And uh, the ladybird is supposed to be representing a Catholic oh. living in Protestant England, uh, because ladybird comes from the Catholic term "Our Lady," so oh, it was code for a Catholic I person. See. Despite okay. it being illegal at the time. So the fire may refer to the Catholic priests who burned at the stake for their beliefs. Mm, okay. And that's all I have to say about Lady Bird, Lady Bird. Okay. Wow. 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 Next is a personal favorite. This is Lucy Lockett, who I've never heard Red, of. I've never heard of it, but it's a new favorite. It's a new favorite. Um, it's just a one liner. She's real quick. But Lucy Lockett lost her pocket and Kitty Fisher found it. Nothing in it, nothing in it, but the binding round it. And so here's the story. That's about me. And I left everything on the floor and got robbed. Right? So one of the people is a barmaid. So you were right. Um, Both of them are sex Mm. workers in the 18th century. Kitty and Lucy. Lucy was also a barmaid. Um, So she was doing a bunch of side hustles uh popular sex workers and lucy lost her pocket Uh oh lucy lockett lost her pocket her pocket at the time that was slang for like a john or like one of your regular clients oh i thought meant like a pocketbook okay so okay i also thought that until i looked it up yeah so pocket i guess because they would fill your pocket after work you Mm, know what i'm saying okay they were like the source of the funds or whatever Yeah. yeah so if you lost your pocket that meant like you lost a client essentially so Lucy Lockett lost her pocket and Kitty Fisher oh, found okay. it. So all of a sudden, little Miss Kitty, Kitty Fisher scooped sc- scooped up the John that Lucy got rid of. Um and nothing in it, nothing in it but the binding round it is basically the whole thing is that Lucy later found out after losing her client that Kitty started seeing him and this caused a bunch of drama. The spat was apparently very well known back then between Lucy and Kitty. Oh, wow. So this is a real story? I guess so. And it says it was very well known at the time, wow. the, the fight between Kitty and Lucy. And Kitty claimed that she, oh, this is the nothing in it, nothing in it, but the binding around it. Kitty ended up going around town talking about this fight she was in with Lucy, claiming that she found a ribbon around the guy or when she next saw him he had a ribbon around him and sex workers at the time kept their money tied Mm. around their thigh with a ribbon so it was almost like 
oh, she claimed him because now he's he's got the ribbon around him. It was kind of like a like finding out that like you broke up with your girl right. at the milkshake diner and then you see her pinned <gasps> from a, like another guy's pin That's, is on her that jacket. Hurt. That hurts. You know, that it's hurts. like, oh, she's going steady with someone else now. So Kitty's binding it, every is time. around him now. That's in. It sounds dirtier than it probably is meant to be, but okay. But yeah, so Kitty's Kitty's got Bound him. Up. Gotcha. Wrapped up in wow, her it ribbon. Wow, gets dirtier every time we say it. <laughs> <laughs> sure does. Anyway, I love that children are just singing about like apparently a famous fight between two I'm sex like, oh, workers. This one's not even subtle. Okay, gotcha. <laughs> Um, another one is Here We Go Around the Mulberry Bush. I sure know that one. I do too. So that one was in, from 1840, and apparently it came from England's Wakefield Prison. Oh! Because there was actually, and there really was a mulberry bush in the prison yard, and this is where the female inmates were forced to, uh, if they were going to exercise, they had to do daily walks around the mulberry bush. Oh, shit. And apparently, this is, I saw on a few sources that they had their kids too, because I guess back then, if you had, you just like kept raising your children while in jail. Oh, excellent. So uh, you're just moms and kids walking around the mulberry bush in prison together. And here's a fun fact. If it's the same mulberry bush that people allege it was, then that mulberry bush has been on the prison grounds and was on the prison grounds through 2017 from 1840 to 2017. It? it died of a beetle infestation. The new verse. But it <laughs> but it was a contender uh the year before. So in 2016, it was uh one of the runner-ups for the tree of the year prize. <laughs> and I don't know if that means like out of all the trees in prison or oh, like gosh in town i don't i don't know um i get why it'd be tree of the year if there's a whole nursery rhyme that's hundreds of years old <laughs> tree of the year but i don't mean to belittle anyway, it but uh, anyway tree of the year is quite something also isn't it a bush okay anyway go on you know i feel like tree of the year is something that like a cartoon tree would be like shooting for by the end of the movie you know it's like i will make tree of the year one day dad will be and proud i'll be of able me. to sing you know and play sports yeah <laughs> everything's possible um okay another one is pop goes the weasel oh sure yeah that one i know that one is about poverty in england oh where apparently this is why i mentioned cockney earlier because cockney is used in this where the weasel is cockney for a suit or a coat okay sorry so wait sorry so now i think i'm confused because i feel like are there multiple mulberry bush songs or am i just making that up because oh that's what i'm saying oh, like are i they thought the same this song? was the song uh, all around na, the mulberry na, 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 bush na, na, na. the monkey chased the weasel the monkey thought it was all in fun but pop goes the weasel or whatever and then but the other one is here we go around the mulberry bush that was off tune but you know what i mean it's a different song i guess why are there so many mulberry bushes <laughs> maybe they're the same tune I feel like in the 1800s, they came up with like one tune and just ran with it and just picked new words. Here we words. go around the mulberry bush. So Is it? wait, maybe that's the wrong song. Here we go around the... I'm like fucking myself Isn't up Isn't it here. here we go around the mulberry bush? Here we go around the... Yeah. Here we go around the mulberry bush. The mulberry the bush. Mulberry mulberry bush. bush. Here we go down the mulberry bush. So early in the... Mo I don't know the rest of the line. I think they're the same song. They're just different words. This is the way we brush our teeth, brush our teeth, brush our teeth. Okay, that's the next verse, in case you're wondering. <laughs> um, so maybe Pop Goes the Weasel. It's the same. No, it's different. Because th this one goes all around the mulberry bush, the monkey chase the weasel. That's different. Round and round the mulberry bush. No, that's not monkey chase the weasel. No, goes Pop Goes the, the Weasel. weasel. Isn't that's no? not the lyrics to Pop Goes the Weasel. No. How does Pop it go? Pop Goes the Weasel is different. Pop goes. And now you're freaking me out. Hang on, I'm looking up the lyrics. Maybe I just combined them in my head like I thought they were the same. It's like Tuppany Rice and Treacle or something, what? right? <laughs> maybe I've just been saying it. Uh, I guess this, maybe this is like the, the old school lines. Maybe they did change it. Round and... So the original lines, which is what I have written down, uh -huh. 
half a half a pound of tuppany rice, half a pound of treacle. That's the way the money goes. Pop goes. What about the, the one like we no? sing literally at Leona's story time? That's like all around the mulberry bush, the monkey chased the weasel. The monkey thought it was all in fun till, and then everyone goes pop goes the weasel. That's how we do it at story time. So I don't know if that if that's just a new version or. It feels like they collabed and created. It, it almost feels like they got mixed together. Yeah. It is one of the more popular singing songs, although the first written records of the song date to the mid-19th century. It's believed the origins go further back to the 18th century in England. Okay. Oh, there's a UK version and a USA version. So you're probably doing the USA version. Oh, I guess so. The UK version was published in the 1800s. Yeah. That, okay. So the one okay, I'm talking right, about is right. the original so this UK is just, version. They just add mulberry bush maybe I wonder because if it's... it's a different story with a mulberry bush. It's kind of like when Cardi it's B the same like, as features it's on a show. It's like, same. it's like, oh, Mulberry well, Bush is like featuring well, she does, guest spot like, on Pop Cardi Goes B the Weasel. Cardi B is also featured on Pop Goes the Weasel, at least the one I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, um, yeah, that does feel... I wonder if it's because the, the songs are so similar that we just slammed them together. We were it's like, like one of the verses from the original was like round and round the chestnut tree. So maybe they just took Mulberry Bush because it's the same amount of syllables. <laughs> Yeah. So the the one uh, from England is about poverty in England. Okay. Where essentially it's listing things that they had to sell <gasps> or they had to pawn the oh, weasel shit. for. And weasel was cockney for your coat or your suit. So they the first line is about like food that they wanted to eat. And then they say, well, pop goes the weasel. Like, oh, I have to pawn this Aww. thing now to be able to afford That's that. That's terrible. The second verse is about a night out at a music hall. The third one is at, like wanting to get drinks, which I love that children are just singing about like getting fucked like, up. I but can't they have even to pawn get a pint. something for their alcohol. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, here it is. Half a pound of tuppany rice, half a pound of treacle. That's the way the money goes. Pop goes the weasel. And then it, it keeps listing things. The coat off my own back or like the shirt off my back, basically. Okay. Yeah. That, well, I'm going to have to wow. figure out okay, how to afford this. So pop goes the weasel. Where's the drinking one? Oh, so it's also Cockney. I think it's Cockney. It's it's at least slang. It was at least slang at the time. Weasel is definitely okay. Cockney. I don't know about these two. But one of the lines is, every night when I go out, the oh. monkey's on the table. So that's where you're thinking about monkey. Yeah. That is where it had to have it had to have grabbed from that. Take a stick and knock it off. Pop goes the weasel. And apparently monkey on the table and s take a stick and knock it off. That was slang at the time for alcohols on the table. To knock it off meant to drink it. To knock off the alcohol oh. from the table is to grab it and drink it. Okay. So anyway, love that it was uh, just dubbed, but kids were saying, I got to get fucked up. Come on, Time give to them the benefit of the doubt. They're not getting fucked up. They just want to, uh, one or two to, to take off the edge off. Just a sip. Just a little buzz. Yeah, that's sweet. <laughs> so another song, Rub-a-Dub-Dub. -dub. Splashing in the tub, thinking everything was all right. That one? No. Okay. <laughs> mm. I yeah. mean, I'm serious. That's not it? Because I did learn that in elementary. It, I did know. Well, I think, are you thinking of the song Splish Splash? Oh, yeah, Just... yeah, yeah, yeah. Never mind. Yeah. No, a uh, rubber dub dub. I feel like I heard it before. I think I'm mixing it up with like rubber ducky, rubber ducky from yeah, that's Sesame a classic. Street. Don't ruin that one for me. I hope now that one's actually about poverty. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. No. Um. <laughs> so there's two versions. There's a more popular version now, which sounds very fruity. Um, rubber dub dub. Three men in the tub. And how do you think they got there? The butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker, it was enough to make a man stare. So that's the new version. <laughs> I like it. Okay. Which I, I love. I kind of just want to keep it there. Uh -oh. I especially want to keep it there when I hear the original version. I think in the game of telephone, I think the word just got mixed up. And now that's what people say. I think that's what happened is that the word just got mixed up. Because the original version is rub-a-dub-dub -dub, three maids in a tub. How do you think they got there? The butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker, and all of them gone to the fair. And so, translated TLDR, they were at a peep show and they were oh, watching Three Maids in a Tub. Oh, they were like putting a show on. 
Yeah. So like the butcher, the baker, and the candlestick maker were all at the fair, go into a peep show and see the, the butcher three maids put the, tub. the girls in the bathtub. But I'm glad that that that's where my true crime brain oh, went. I'm so glad that was not the case. Anyway, I like them being gay instead and just having like a kiki versus like agreed. Okay, cool. So let's stick that with that. Here's another kind of gay one, and by kind I mean for sure. Um, Georgie Porgy putting in <gasps> pie. Okay, yeah. Do you know about the her? Girls have made them. Can cry? I say her? I'm I'm she herring Georgie she her, Porgy. She her. <laughs> um, sorry, my oh my uh, sorry, my lights went out. It's as soon as I'm talking about the gay stuff, it gets a little romantic in here. Sorry, please hold. Okay, great. Okay, Georgie Porgy putting in pie, kissed the girls and made them cry. When the boys came out to play, Georgie mm-hmm. Porgy ran away. That's how it goes. Uh, ironically, I grew up hearing the gay one because my recess was homophobic, I guess. But the song that I heard up, I heard growing up was Georgie Porgy putting in pie, kissed the girls and made them cry. When the boys came out to play, what? he kissed them too because I've he was never gay. heard that. And I think that was, I think that was just like kids being dicks, but it actually, ironically, is about uh, the oh, lover of so, King so James the kids the like first. read between the lines without <laughs> even realizing it. And we're like, ha, it's funny to be gay. But like, in reality, that is the underlying meaning of this story. <laughs> oh, <laughs> the underlying meaning is that it was this guy named George. I think I'm saying his name right. Villiers. Um, he there's no. It's very heavily implied that he was the lover of King James the first, uh, and that they had a very intense Ooh. friendship, and they were roommates, I probably. Um, but so King James the first ended up being so close to George that he kept giving him new titles, gave him power and influence. And I don't know if Georgie was in love with King James or was like maybe uh. manipulatively doing this just to get power. I don't know. But the king even even dissolved Parliament twice to keep him from being impeached, to keep oh George from being impeached from his own titles. Through their relationship, he was later named the first Duke of Buckingham. Um, there's allegedly King James publicly said to people, you may be sure that I love the Earl of Buckingham more than anyone else and more than you who are here assembled. <laughs> Go off, king. <laughs> Literally. <Gay>. <laughs> <laughs> But you know, like his dad was like, "Oh yeah. my god, how's your friend from college? I'm just I hope so that your glad business partner is doing you well. Have solid friendships, you know. Wow, yeah, what a good friend. Um, while they were hooking up, allegedly, Georgie Porgy was uh-huh. also a womanizer, so he was mm. hitting and quitting quite often. So he kissed the girls and made them cry. He was also sleeping with a lot of." the daughters and wives of noblemen and he kept getting away with it because the king would protect him. Okay, so this guy's bad news. So when the boys came out to... He's just a fuck boy. And like, for Uh everybody. No one's safe. Um, And so when the boys came out to play, Georgie Porgy ran away because he had to go hide behind the king. the boys were like, we're here to play. Yeah. (laughs) And like, he was kind (laughs) of like, like, oh, in a bad way? No, 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 never mind, actually. Gotcha. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> anyway i thought it was interesting That's that i actually wild. did grow up hearing like the made-up gay that version i recently gave um a friend uh who has a daughter that just turned three and um leona has this book and uh, my mother-in-law sherry got it for her and it is called uh oh my god i keep screwing up the name of it hold on this is i promise this is important one moment um no worries oh it's called it's called What Are Little Girls Made Of? Um, it's And it's by, oh, let's see, Jean Willis. I feel like I've heard and, of that. And uh, so it's basically like a twist on the uh, on a ton of like a, uh, classic nursery rhymes. But it's the t- like the subtitle of the book is Nursery Rhymes for Modern Times, I think, or for Feminist Times. Sorry. So basically it's all like flipped mm. or with the Georgie Porgy one, it's like... Uh, Georgie Porgy putting pie kissed a girl as she walked by and then it turns into like she turned around and said hey stop you know like 
you can't touch me without my consent oh, or whatever. Like, I but they're very that. cleverly written and there's so many good ones in there. Um, and I've been giving that to people as actually just had the bookstore near me order a bunch more. Cause I think it's such a cool book. Um, but yeah. Oh, I love that. I'll, I'll take a copy. Yeah, I will send you one. It's hey, so, so that cute. And like the ones, there's... um, they're just like very, and there's one where it's like, anytime there's a doctor, you know, it's like a female doctor, like Humpty Dumpty. Um, the doctor is a black woman now, not like some, random dude you know so it's very it's very fun and uh very feminist one of the books that i my mom always had on her like in our like foyer by like the the front door and everything she always had a book on a table that was politically accurate bedtime stories oh yeah you talked about this i grew up with that book and i have it now but it's it's kind of the same concept it's like but it's very fun uh Anyway, no, I'll totally very, take a uh, copy of that. That's very cute. Next up, we have Old King Cole. Okay, I do know this one vaguely. You know the one? Old King Cole, it, Old King Cole was, was a merry old soul, and a merry old soul was he. He called for his pipe, and he called for his three. bowl, and he right. called for his fiddlers three. Every fiddler, he had a fiddle, and a very fine fiddle had he. Twee, Tweedledee, Tweedledee, went the fiddlers. Oh, there's none so rare as we can compare with King Cole and his fiddlers three. So it's just like, look at King Cole and his three little musicians. Not a fucked a up good one? Time. Uh, not, well, it is fucked up, but in a fun fact way. So um, they think stories suggest King Cole is actually old Thomas Cole, who was a wealthy English merchant, all better known as Thomas of Reading. And this is... I think this is like a different folk tale that people knew about. And then this song came from okay. that folk tale. So it's not, I don't think a real person. If it is, it's fucking fascinating. <laughs> and they should have done a documentary on him. Um, because Thomas of Reading, the character in this folk tale, he was from the 16th century. And during his travels, he would often stop at a pub mm. called the ostrich and the ostrich, the landlords there happened to be serial killers what and they would rig a trap door to drop guests into a vat of boiling water <laughs> jeez and the thing about thomas of reading is that he happened to stay at the ostrich five different times and each time without even knowing what was going on narrowly fumbling around death. and like like la di da and like pianos and anvils fumbling are around. falling behind him and he's not okay gotcha yes yes Exactly. And the landlords are like, God damn it. Like, we know he's rich. We need him. We need to steal it his took money. so of all long people, to and they boil just can't... all this water. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine how long it would take to a cauldron fit for a human being. Yeah. Anyway, so he just keeps narrowly avoiding it. But apparently he's like just very happy go lucky bumbling around. So maybe they think, like, oh, how merry was he? Yeah, I would be merry too. Soul. This, this uh, origin is often theorized but unlikely another origin guess is that old king cole is actually a com a combination of two rulers at different times named cole one was an english king named cole the old yikes oh. <laughs> and a celtic ruler named cole the magnificent who got such a better deal in the name yeah <laughs> But both of them happened to have music loving daughters who inspired the line that Cole was always calling for his fiddlers. Oh, that's nice. So those are the two theories. I personally like the serial killer one. Obviously. You would. And now you've mentioned this one quite a lot today. So let's talk about Humpty Dumpty, who has a very interesting background. Do you know about I, the I do. theories? I do that he fell off his horse and they didn't want to. And he was. Yeah. Yeah. He was like he like tried to go fight and fell off his horse and yeah so Humpty Dumpty was from 1797 and he is not a person or or, or he might be a person but that's some of the theories he's definitely not an egg <laughs> which a lot of people think he is um the actual one of the main thoughts is that he's actually a cannon the name of a cannon oh I didn't know that who was used to control uh used to gain control during the English Civil War and during part of the battle the cannon was sitting on a church tower until cannonballs hit the cannon, like opposing cannonballs hit that cannon and the cannon named Humpty Dumpty fell off the tower and <gasps> shattered. Oh no. And although retrieved, the cannon could not be repaired because it was so heavy. Oh, I've never heard that theory. Okay. 
Others say that Humpty Dumpty was a person and he was just a town drunk who fell off a wall and hit his head because in the 18th century, Humpty Dumpty was a word for a drink, which sounds very similar to the drink I mentioned last time. But a Humpty Dumpty was boiled ale and brandy. Oh, I thought you were going to say with egg whites. And I was like, the egg, it all makes sense. Oh, you know that? That's a double entendre, you know what I'm saying? It sure is. But if you boil brandy and ale, apparently you're having an 18th century Humpty Dumpty. And so that would, that alcohol, if people drank it, they also became Humpty Dumpties in their own way. Gotcha. Others say, it, like you said, is King Richard III. Because Richard, for a few okay. reasons. One, because apparently he had really bad scoliosis and he had a hump. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yikes. Yikes. Okay. Um, I don't even know if that's true. That's just the story that people go off of that he had scoliosis. So maybe that was like a really fucked up nickname that they gave him. Um, also, like you said, one time in battle, Richard, Richard fell off of his horse and he was very quickly sliced up by his enemy's swords and he couldn't get up because he was so sliced into pieces. And so his... Because he was so sliced. He was yeah. so... I wish that meant drunk, but it means <laughs> literally sliced. He was so sliced. And also his own, just like in the, the, the rhyme, his men could not put him back together again. Yuck. Yikes. Um, and then fun fact, this is where I tell you that people get the egg thought from Humpty Dumpty because Lewis Carroll's Looking Through the Looking Glass, 1871, has uh, it's Humpty just Dumpty's through egg. looking glass, right? What did I say? Looking through the looking glass. <laughs> oh, I'm so no, stupid. You're Sorry. Not yeah, stupid. through the looking just, glass. I just was like, looking through the looking glass. That would be unnecessary. I was like, that, seem- that seems like the title of somebody's dissertation. <laughs> you know, it's like, play on words, looking through the looking glass. <sighs> um, so there's that. That's Humpty Dumpty. I promise I'm almost done. I know that I've been doing no, a lot of I'm, these, Listen, but... I'm, I'm in it. Well, here's what I've never heard of before. It's called Oranges and Lemons. I love it already. I, I like a citrus. Uh, I like you oranges. Do? You like lemons. <laughs> okay. I was like, are you sure? <laughs> uh, but apparently there's this song called Oranges and Lemons. Say the bells. Uh, oranges and Lemons say the bells of St. Clemens. You owe me five farthings, say the bells of St. Martin's. When will you pay me, say the bells of Old Bailey. When I grow rich, say the bells of Shoreditch. When will that be, say the bells of Stepney. I do not know, say the great bell of Bow. or says the great bell of Bow. Here comes a candle to light you to bed, and here comes a chopper to chop off your head. Chip, Whoa. chop, chip, chop, the last one is dead. It's fun for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> i was like, like i feel like oh, i kind of really get it like the there's a, you know they're probably just referencing what are they referencing different par- areas and saying like oh this one's po- impoverished this different one london is- churches yeah yeah okay yeah you're pretty much on it, it was the each phrase was being said by a different london church and so the thought is that it's this man who's en route passing by each of the london churches on his way to his execution (gasps) oh okay okay and then he gets to the last one and here comes the chopper to chop off your head boy oh boy yuck we've also got a classic from 1744 we know it well london bridge aha and some think that it refers to the london bridge's poor conditions after the great fire of london um, others say that it was actually inspired by a real life Viking attack in 1014. Oh, geez. Uh, where the London Bridge, I guess, fell or was trying to be pulled down. And there's kind of speculation about whether or not it's a Viking attack. The only real evidence we have is a very loosely translated poem. And the poem is from 1230. Sure. Wow. Um, but also, if it's from 1230. And the song doesn't come out for like another 500 years. And it was loosely translated. They don't really think it that was, was like probably. a thin, yeah, yeah. Kind of a stretch. Um, and a, another one that people think that this has to do with, with London Bridges falling down, falling down. They think that this might have to do with the practice at the time of immurement. Oh, which was I've heard of this. A medieval punishment, but also a sacrifice, a human sacrifice, where victims were bricked into the foundations of buildings to bless the building and ensure that it would never collapse. Which I don't know yeah, it was like how that works. It can collapse on a person for sure. 
<laughs> I think it yeah, wasn't it like once it's at the end, like as a like it's it's open, it's built. Now we have to encase someone in it <laughs> as a sacrifice yeah, to make were, sure like, it doesn't fall. Locked in. Which is why the second part of the rhyme is take the key and lock her up. Yeah, lock yeah, her yeah, up. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yikes. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe that was the fair lady they're talking about. Is she got locked up. Um, anyway, there's no evidence of this actually happening at London Bridge, to be clear. Mm-hmm. But um, that is where they think the history is. It's either a Viking attack, a Viking attack, disrepair from a fire, or immurement. Yeah. All bad. <laughs> All bad. Then there's uh, Rockabye Baby. Uh oh, I sang this. Seventeen sixty five. Last night. No, this one. This one is not bad. This one's just drama. Oh. Um, in seventeen sixty five, Rockabye Baby comes out. Smash hit, I'm sure. Smash because hit. featuring Cardi B, <laughs> you know it was gonna be a banger. Featuring what who is it? The Whomping Willow? Who was it earlier? The fuck oh the Mulberry <laughs> Bush. The Mulberry Bush. Like, the what? <laughs> oh, the Mulberry featuring the Mulberry Mulberry Bush. Some sort of some sort of tree. By the way, um, by the way, R.I.P. Mulberry Bush, you were not appreciated in your time. You never got <laughs> I love that you told me that it was up for tree of the year, but then like it obviously didn't win, which is like devastating to hear before it died. I didn't say it in those words, but you did catch on to what I was saying it just took me a while it took me like a half hour to be like well that's pretty sad anyway not appreciate in your own time is exactly how i would take i mean there is a several hundred year long uh, yeah, still standing point. strong rhyme about fair it fair point fair point i mean if you know how they say like plants can hear and shit imagine that mulberry bush going fucking nuts from having to hear its own goddamn song sang to it every day all day long Oh my god! By the way, its ego was out of control. I'm kind of I glad mean, it didn't honestly, win the award. when it, it needed to be no humbled. Wonder, no wonder it just went away in 2017 after it didn't win 2016 Tree of the Year. Uh, it was like oh, I'm so done. embarrassed, probably so embarrassed. I'm done. <laughs> or how many years does did the Tree Award even exist, and how long did it take for it to even be on the roster? I mean, to be honest, that like, had to be who mortifying. the fuck won the Tree of 2016? Because like, did they have a song written about them? I was it the giving it. tree was it the whomping willow what like what what could possibly have why been? do we know so many famous greeneries oh so... i found it it's the oldest tree of batashek in hungary big Boo. 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 Lame. oh they pour <laughs> wine on it every year okay i'm back in oh can you lie under the tree and accidentally catch I'll the like, wine oops. <laughs> <laughs> just reading ah Okay, Rockabye Baby. So, uh, drama. Apparently, King James the Second. Which I love the like. How many nursery rhymes were made after British royalty? Like that's. I. Uh. So King James the Second, he was having a hard time producing an heir, and he snuck. This is uh the rumor is that he snuck another man's baby into the castle's birthing chamber to guarantee that the throne would stay under Roman Catholic control. Jesus. So they tricked everyone that a baby was born by him he just like took someone's baby and was like it's mine i assume there i i mean if we're getting really into it i bet there was a contract or something i don't know but also does that mean like the rest of the british line is not like authentically you know what i mean interesting fun fact more drama that is still relevant today folks um anyway so this is what another one of those reaches but every source says that this is what it's about but rockabye baby uh when the how does it go? Rock my baby on the treetop. When, when the wind, wind blows, blows, the cradle, the cradle will, rock. will rock. When the bow breaks, um, the cradle will fall, fall, and down will come baby, cradle and all. Yeah. Okay, so the wind blowing apparently is symbolic of the Protestant forces blowing through to demand a, a change and out of Catholic control. Okay. And when, what else? Oh, the cradle apparently symbolizes the royal house which later had a big fall sure they're on the treetop because they're like the big man in charge (sighs) the castle if you will yeah they're high up there but so the cradle did fall and then down came baby cradle and all which i guess means the king and his people the earliest printed version yeah. of this song, by the way, did have a warning at the end that says, this may serve as a warning to the proud and ambitious who climb so high that they generally fall. 
Whoa. Whoa. Which Shots makes fired. me think that this was not meant for children to begin with. But if it was, we all know that the children would sing the fun song part. And then you with your blacked out eyes would walk up and just read the footnote. <laughs> I'd be like, do you know what this is really about? <laughs> this is for this is a warning to the proud and ambitious. <laughs> read the end of the pamphlet. Uh. <laughs> okay. My favorite one um, is... Not my, maybe one of my favorite. This is my favorite one. Jack and Jill. Mm. We love them. Love them. 1765. Some say that Jack and Jill were not brother and sister doing chores because they were, Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Apparently, they might have actually been a secretive young couple who would sneak up to a hill together. We say they were fetching a pail of water and then take 30 minutes. You know what I'm saying? We're getting a pail of water. He fell down. It was a whole thing. Don't even worry yeah. about it. <laughs> drama um but apparently they whatever they were doing up on that hill led to a pregnancy Ooh. and the theory goes though that um the child ended up dying from ch- or the, the the girl died from childbirth oh no after giving birth to the baby and this is like a local uh a local lore in, i think it's in somerset in this area where jack and jill is supposedly to said to have happened Mm -hmm. and when the when jill died from childbirth the town took care of the baby where was jack men suck through and through okay so um i thought he fell the town took care of the baby yeah but i always thought a crown is like the one in your tooth not like your whole head oh i thought they meant his head i always thought they meant his tooth hmm well, they didn't have anyway. crown. They didn't have dentistry back then. You're right. You're right. It was probably his head for sure. Um, but so anyway, the baby is alone in the town. The town takes care of the baby, and they just refer to it as Jill's son. And through the power of telephone over the years, apparently a very common last name in that area is Gilson, mm-hmm. and they think it came from the town taking care of Gil. Jill's son. son. <gasps> That's so if cool. your last name is Gilson in that area, they like to claim that they are of Jack and Jill fame. That is pretty crazy. Another version of Jack and Jill is that it was actually about Louis the 16th and his wife, Marie Antoinette. Um, but that doesn't make sense because the references don't make sense. And also Jack and Jill was written 30 years before them. Okay. Next. <laughs> Next. Uh, <laughs> This is the one I think will be your favorite of the day is that Charles the first King Charles the first it tried to increase taxes on alcohol. Boo. Boo. But uh, units. Uh, oh, how do I say this? They usually measured alcohol in units at the time known as Jack's or Jill's. Really? Did you know this? No. Apparently, I think it might have been Jackson Gills because it's a G, but I don't know if it's a hard G or a soft okay. G. Okay. But Jackson Gills, Jackson Gills. Um, and so when he tried to increase the taxes on Jacks and Gills of alcohol, uh-huh. that failed. So he broke his crown or he lost the, the trust of the people. <gasps> they broke his king crown instead uh-huh. of his head crown. And to recover, he tried to reduce the price of Jacks and Gills. So but... Jill went tumbling after. Mm-hmm. Wow. And also, I guess he tried to reduce the price of Jack's, and then he tried to do it twice as intensely to Jill's. So that's why Jill would come tumbling after Jack, because <gasps> she had a bigger price decrease. Whoa, that is bananas. Okay. I had no Good idea. Good time, right? Good time. Okay, we have... I have... Two more left for you. Okay. If, you, if you're still cool with that. I know I've been talking for like over an hour Come on. Now. Come on. What okay. do you think we do here? I know. I just, this is a lot. Usually I would have picked like the top five or whatever, but I just, I kept finding new ones and I was like, ah, holy shit. Okay. I mean, you're, you're so, the one who has an appointment to get to. So it's all you, baby. You, you do you. I'll just, uh, I'm here for the ride. Well, is there one that I haven't covered yet that you're expecting? Um, you know, every time you say one, I'm like, oh, duh. But I, uh, oh, I know. Ring around the rosy. Bingo. So 1881, this comes out. And they say it. I mean, we all have heard the rumors that it just might be about the 1665 Great Bubonic Plague of London. Mm. And 
the rosy in Ring Around the Rosy would be the rash that mm. was because it makes a rosy colored rash um, when you have the plague. Mm -hmm. And apparently these rosies did not smell very good because we've talked about this in the past but with bubonic plague bubos would come out on your body yeah. which were these big lumps that would kind of explode Ugh. and they did not smell very good so when these rosies would come up with this rose colored <gasps> rash and then they would pop and it smelt very bad people would try to conceal the stench with a pocket full of posies wow okay and one of the signs was of uh one of the signs you were sick trust me you fucking knew if you had the plague but in case you didn't know you sneezed a lot too <laughs> and so <laughs> one of the one of the phrases in the song is sometimes ashes ashes we all fall down it was originally probably at you at you we all fall down no way like sneezing and then fall down aka you are you drop dead yeah um but it has over time been changed into ashes, ashes, which is only worse because now it's like, oh, you've been cremated because say, yeah, you it, all fell yeah, down. It still has the same vibe, unfortunately. Another source said that it could have been saying rashes, rashes. Oh, interesting. Um. Anyway, we all get the gist. We've heard that one a million times. But the song wasn't actually documented until hundreds of years after the plague. And the earlier versions are said to have not had these references. So. Oh. We don't know if it only maybe changed with the rumor that it had something to do with the plague. Yeah, like, and like people kind up, of like they created it. each other. Right, right, right. Um, but there's also one historian who says that it might have been about the Protestants' religious ban on dancing because people started having this workaround when it came to not having to dance. They would say, oh, we're not going dancing. We're just going to have a play party where we do ring games. And oh. a ring game, which is Ring Around the Rosy, is when you would just all stand in a ring and spin in a circle. Yeah, we which do was it a story different time from all day. <laughs> it's just we're just spinning. We're not dancing. We're just mm -hmm. spinning in a ring. Duh. Versus like you know normal dancing. <laughs> also, music at the time, which they were trying to keep you from dancing from, had like musical instruments and a ring around the rosy or ring games where you just singing. Then there was no instrument, so it technically wasn't dancing. Technically, it's I, I love you know I love semantics. I, I do. Uh, if we ever have to break a rule, I will be coming to you about how we will be defining the whole thing. Thank you would have you. made a lovely lawyer. Oh, that's nice. Except that I'm way too impatient. And I don't like hard and work. And you cry a lot. <laughs> and I cry. I'm so <laughs> sensitive. Yeah. But thank you. That's a very <laughs> kind thing to say. Uh, anyway, so it most the most common theory is that it's the plague version. Mm, okay. uh, and then... Another very cool one that I, cool to me and you, Mary, Mary, Quite Contrary. Do you know this one? How does your garden grow? Yes. Do you know who it's about? Uh-uh. Girl, Bloody Mary. Ah! Uh, who we have covered, by the way, in a past episode, so please go check out that episode. But she was known for torturing and murdering Protestants. Oh, and Jesus. Mary, Mary, quite contrary. How does your garden grow? She's pretty contrary. Silver... That's the gentle way to put it. <laughs> contrary is probably the best word they could slip into a rhyme without being executed. With exactly, yeah, it's a it's like the most word. diplomatic way yes, you could say diplomatic. it. Yes, because I'm imagining a lot of these were. I mean, how many of these have I gone over where it's like, oh, during like Protestant Some England sort of upheaval or or yeah, exactly. This just feels like a bunch of Catholics got together and wanted to be petty. And they were like, how can we write vague rhymes about Catholics, the system? I mean, as a former Catholic myself, I'd be honest, very good at being petty. That is one of the strengths, I believe, of being a Catholic. No wonder they were like making their kids sing it too, because they were like, we have to push the narrative. Like, they let's love keep booze. Catholicism alive wherever we can. Yeah, They love booze. They love drama. They love to uh, be petty. So it makes sense. <laughs> bingo, bingo. Yep. Well... Bloody Mary, uh, a.k.a. Queen Mary the First, I think she was. Um, but the, the, the rhyme goes, Mary, Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells and pretty maids all in a row. And it said that these silver bells were thumb screws she used to torture people. And the cockle shells were torture devices for male genitalia. <gasps> cockle shells mm -hmm. no 
And after the king's death, uh, so this is how it all kind of came to be. Very, very quick TLDR. After the king's death, the throne went to Mary, who promptly tried to make England Catholic again. So she was very contrary in the fact that England was happily Protestant at the time. And she went, eh, we're going to fix that. So okay. when they say, how does your garden grow? Apparently garden, first of all, rhymes with garden gardener gardenier or sounds like gardener which was the name of mary's only supporter also it could be a dig at her own infertility or garden could be replaced with graveyard in reference to all of her victims right like it's growing you're adding to your garden Mm -hmm. quote unquote with all your torture devices oh god um and then the last one i'll leave you on uh I've got one and then a fun fact. So here's, I'll leave you on three blind mice. Oh, okay. From 1805. Although the original version is apparently from 1609, 200 years before that. Whoa. And it's another ode to Bloody Mary. Because, really? So she gets two fucking nursery rhymes. That's what how you know you've made it. Fuck? Yeah. That's how, how you know you've murdered trees enough getting awards. People. Killers are getting rhymes. Like, what do I got to do? I'll make you, I already made you a limerick. I don't know whatever happened to it, but I think I made you a limerick. I think you did. We'll have to replay that episode at some point and figure out where it went. There once was a baby named M who, whose pronouns were they and them. No, shut up. That doesn't work. There once was a baby named M who drank milkshakes, although it caused phlegm. Oh. One day they announced. Hold on. One day they did say to till the end of the day, their pronouns would be they and them. Okay, let me say it again. Them and they. Them and they. Wait, there once was a (laughs) there once was a baby named M who drank milkshakes, Milkshakes. although it caused phlegm. Then one of these day. Wait, what did I say? (laughs) <laughs> you said and then i and then m did say say on one of those days that their pronouns would be they and them because it has to rhyme with m and phlegm what was the announced one oh. they, uh, m one day phlegm. that they announced one, one day, day they announced that they would like to pounce on puppies that would cuddle with them <laughs> <laughs> one day they announced that they changed their pronouns to newly be they and be them. them. Okay. That's Listen, what's up. Somebody write that down. Eva? Okay. And that, by the way, is from she for she, her. So <laughs> you know all about those. That's, You're and the, I'm being, the, that's me being contrary today. The, the so. princess of pronouns uh, before anyone decides to really rip you apart. Okay. Um, <laughs> Christine. You're only just sitting here writing limericks about them. Christine. She was canceled. For up, being so mean. For being so mean the end that's canceled. okay she's canceled there's no no second verse it's like you no, because then on paper you would have written more but it just is strike through oh that's right yeah so i don't yeah. even i'm not even gonna say it. it's strike through doesn't make doesn't count well back to our uh, one of our serial killers she gets two whole nursery rhymes she gets mary mary quite contrary and she gets three blind mice because in this ode to bloody mary the trio or the three blind mice is a group of Protestant bishops who famously tried to overthrow her, but were burned at the stake. Oh, okay. And these three bishops were Hugh Latimer, Nicholas Radley, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer. Mm. And uh, some say that the mice's blindness refers to them being blinded by their religious beliefs. And Mary is the farmer's wife in the poem. So the lyrics Uh. go... Three blind mice, three blind mice, see how they run, see how they run. They all ran after the farmer's wife who cut off their tails with a carving knife. Did you ever see such a sight in your life as three blind mice? Okay. Yeah. I can see why that would be a direct allegory for her. Yeah. (laughs) It's almost like she got, she found out through like the court, the town jester, like, Miss Mary, please, please God, don't kill me. But I have to tell you, someone wrote a rhyme about you, and it's a little inflammatory. And Yeah, it's not really favorable. It's not looking good. Please don't shoot the messenger. I'm just telling you what's going on. And then she went, I'll write one, too. And then she went, have you ever seen such a sight 
a stream blade of mice as I'm carving your fucking tails off. You know, she like she's had like, to come actually, back. I really like this version. She's like, I actually kind of like this uh, attention, this type it's of like if this negative. is the game we're going to play, which like I don't I don't condone what she did. But that's some icon shit. If she secretly would like ghost wrote her own like rebuttal. She's like, here's verse two. <laughs> yeah. Mm. I like I like I'd eat that shit up if it were on social media today. Yeah. This is like a back um, and forth. Yeah. And now I will end on this final fun fact for you about the Muffin Man. The Muffin <laughs> Man? Oh. The Muffin Man. Uh Do you know him? From eight Uh he is on Drury Lane, but some older versions say he was on Crumpet Lane. So All right. maybe he's changed addresses. I guess he's moved. In 1820, this this title comes out, and some say that the Muffin Man was actually inspired by Frederick Thomas Linwood, who was a 16th century muffin seller and murderer. Yeah, I know this one, I think, about the kids, right? He would allegedly tie a muffin to a string, which, by the way, it's not American muffins. They're English muffins. Just a <laughs> I'm sorry i don't know why that's so funny to me but i had an image of the string around a muffin and then you said that and i went oh click and then changed into an english muffin i was like <laughs> that's Thank why you. i changed it i was like it's no lemon poppy seed my friend it's <laughs> no, that stuff not. you put a butter on it's a nooks and crannies okay. situation it's a, it's too crumbly it's a little crumbly it's a little but crumbly. he would allegedly tie an english it. muffin to a string and then he okay. would lure people close enough to beat them to death oh, and geez. it was seven other bakers which i love that they were like probably just as competition and 15 kids <gasps> but here's the thing that story came from a parody site very unlikely to be real even i think the man himself Wait, um, a parody website a parody website like they were it's like the onion so oh um, okay so this isn't like an old standing theory this is just like a a recent this theory. only came out recently through like tiktok I and social see. media I um, see. more likely than anything, the Muffin Man is actually just a poem about 19th century food vendors where a lot of people were working rough hours and they would go to literal English muffin salesmen on the street. Um, but anyway, it's, it's just a fun fact to end on that the Muffin Man could have been a serial killer. Wow. I love and. that someone was like, I know I'll make a website and spread this malicious rumor about somebody who may or may not have existed malicious or delicious <laughs> honestly por que no los dos? you tell me <laughs> por que no los dos um and that is the dark side to many nursery rhymes i mean that was beautifully done thank you i uh, really did talk for a full over an hour about that I, but I, I, it well, was you worth talked, it i think you sang we laughed we cried i feel like this was quite a uh an informative episode so thank you for that thank you thank you i have a story for you uh this is a polish story and uh it is not old i mean it's old i guess it's from 2000 but it's not um, mm. as classic as your <laughs> 11th century poems or whatever you were just talking nothing about nothing is nothing is um this is a story of christian bala and my cousins are polish but i do not speak polish so i am apologizing now if i mispronounce certain words because when my cousins speak polish i stare at them like how do you know german english austrian dialect it's amazing and polish i don't know how you and french and i'm like okay forget it so i'm already embarrassed about my pronunciation i apologize but i really did try and i did uh, watch some videos so on a brisk morning in december 2000 three friends were out fishing together at the Oder river in southwest poland and this part of the river uh was actually very remote and very inaccessible you could only get there by foot after you parked your car like a ways away and you had to kind of meander through some um like thicket you know to get mm -hmm. to the actual fishing spot and not many people made this trek especially in december so it was kind of a very secluded and peaceful spot for these three fishermen the three men this already is sounding like a nursery rhyme three men go to you, the river to fish know, <laughs> the word thicket immediately i thought we were in a, in a poem why did i say thicket probably because you were telling nursery rhymes and i was thinking like 
a tisket, a tasket. I don't know. Uh, the sick part is like, I know you're about to tell me an actual crime. And yet I'm trying to like, I, I keep everything keeps rhyming in my head. Like it, I heard like crime we, and then I went rhyme. And then I like, we, like we want it to be just a classic nursery rhyme based on no real story. But unfortunately, this is factually proven, which is unfortunate. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so it, it, it had its moment where it could have turned fun and then it doesn't. A fisherman um, in a thicket. And I'm the like, three oh, fishermen let's... in a f- thicket. How did they get there? <laughs> they... <laughs> Beep show. <laughs> they were there together because they're gay. <laughs> oh, I wish. I really wish that were the story. Uh, okay. So these three men um, were there to fish in the solitude and enjoy some peace. And that's, of course, when they noticed something floating downstream toward them. Hmm. At first, they're thinking it's a log, but when it gets closer, they notice that there's hair rising above the water. Yikes. So one of the fishermen uh, takes his fishing rod and kind of like prods at the the item in the water, and they find out that this log is not a log at all. It's human remains. So, of course, they immediately contact police, and uh, as soon as police get there and take the body out of the water, they realize this was not a natural drowning to start with, the man was only wearing a sweatshirt and underpants. And oh, it whoa. didn't okay. Yeah. And it didn't seem likely that anyone out for a hike in December in a secluded wooded area would be just in their underwear. So no. it's not like this guy probably just fell in and drowned. But more notably, uh, and more obvious that this was a crime is that he was bound by rope. And this is pretty oh. upsetting. Uh the rope had been wrapped around his neck and hands. So that almost like a hog tie. And it was the type of knot where if you struggle, it tightens around your neck. Oh, yeah. And I my first thought, too, was like, oh, sweatshirt and underwear. I was like, that's what I wear in my own home. So now I'm thinking like someone was in his house when he thought he was like going to go to bed or he was in bed. Yeah. Yeah. You're you're on to it. So. He had been wrapped around with this rope, and this rope had been, like I said, specifically tied uh, so that even if he moved his arms at all or struggled at all, the rope would tighten like a noose around his neck. So he's like essentially killing himself. Yes, yes, yes. And (sighs) he would have had to stay completely still to avoid strangling himself to death. Um, And so investigators immediately consult their missing persons database to narrow down the search to adult men who had been reported missing. And before long, they did match the identity to this 35-year-old man named Darius Janaszewski. 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 Sorry to my cousins. Darius Darius (laughs) Janaszewski. Whoa. Darius Janaszewski. I don't know. I'm going to try that. That sounds right. Uh, this man was a local man from Wrocław, Poland, which was uh, a, about 60 miles from the spot at the river. And it's pretty tragic. They discovered who it was, and his wife was too distraught to identify his remains. So his own mother had to come, and she was able to confirm his identity by recognizing a birthmark on his chest. So. This guy, Darius, had been missing for a while. He was last seen on November 13th, which was nearly a month earlier. And that is when his Mm. wife had reported him missing. The odds were already stacked against investigators because he had been in the river for so long that finding any useful evidence here was unlikely. There was no fingerprints because any DNA or fingerprints had been washed away at this point. uh, And he had decomposed pretty, pretty far along. So a forensics team hiked around the woods, they dove into the river, they scoured the area, but they found absolutely nothing. And of course, Darius could not have put himself in the river this way, so they were just at a loss how this had happened. They did an autopsy, and an autopsy revealed that there was virtually nothing in his stomach or intestines. And basically that means whoever had done this to him had most likely starved him for several days before oh his my god death. yeah they were thinking probably around three days if not more with nothing this is so this eat. is so interesting that it's a man 
Mm, I know. I feel like a lot of times in these kind of brutal, like sadistic cases, you're right. The victims are often women. Or like it's at least a man and a woman. Like he was like the boyfriend of someone that was the, you know, the victim that maybe was being prioritized in the torture and stuff like that. And so, yeah, it's very, this makes me feel like there has to be like a girlfriend somewhere and maybe not, but it's like, I feel like with enough of these stories, I'm like, stereotyping which i shouldn't but it feels like there's another person missing you're like somewhere. sensing a pattern yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 well you're probably onto something um and we will definitely get there um but before that i'll tell you probably one of the saddest parts which is that the volume of water that they found in his lungs indicated that he was still alive when he was tossed <gasps> into the river and then he's told not to struggle or else he'll choke himself yeah, so he basically ends up in the river with a hogtied like that, so that any struggling, which you would obviously do innately, would being strangle you at the water. same time as you're literally drowning. So very fucked up, very dark, just sadistic, really beyond sadistic. So his cause of death actually wasn't asphyxiation or strangulation, but drowning. And people were just so taken aback by the cruelty of this, um, just how sadistic it really was. And the fact that Darius himself was so well loved by family and friends, his wife reported they were in a happy marriage and planning to adopt a child soon. So they were growing Mm. their family. He was a successful business owner. He had many healthy and happy friendships and seemed pretty popular. And they couldn't really find anyone who had any negative things to say about him. There was no evidence, no forensic evidence pointing to suspects, but there was also no motive among his social circle. So they just couldn't understand who not only would want him dead, but would want him to like die in such a sadistic, brutal way. So one criminal psychologist said that the murder must have involved a great deal of anger. And I think you probably picked up on that as well with the mm-hmm. fact that yeah. this was such a like thought out premeditated situation. Um, It seemed very personal, like somebody planned this very carefully. And police considered at first that it could have been a gang execution. Um, Like maybe Darius was involved in some sort of organized criminal activity and it went south. Uh, But the more they dug, the more that kind of just started to feel unrealistic and like probably isn't what really happened. Um, He had no prior criminal history. They couldn't even find a link between him and any sort of organized crime group. His record, his life appeared virtually flawless. And that's it. They felt like they had hit a dead end. And so the case just began to grow cold. The media at this point, when the case was kind of floundering, described the murder as, quote, the perfect crime. And investigators were feeling very um, pressured by the public to make some sort of break, to make any sort of inroad and find any sort of clue they possibly could. So what they did, because the case was getting cold is they turned to poland's most popular crime show uh whose host was michael (laughs) fajbowicz christine i'm so sorry michael fajbowicz i gotta tell you i feel like there's a lot of uh, languages that we hear more often that we are kind of able to fake mimic and hope that we're doing it right polish is out of control that's like i just never hear that one i know and i i feel like i should know it better um but i know let's call him michal michal that's close enough right sure uh okay so media exposure had helped solve polish criminal cases before so investigators were like hey maybe if he covers this on his crime show it'll get us some leads right it's kind of like america's most wanted like i was gonna say is there a, a name for it or uh you know don't say it never mind don't say it. it's probably polish <laughs> it's called no um, poland's most wanted poland's most- <laughs> that's good so they thought well maybe we'll get some leads this way um and maybe somebody maybe somebody's memory would be jogged maybe they saw something the night that he disappeared and they'll r- reach out and call in uh perhaps there were witnesses out there they didn't know that had seen something significant didn't realize it and would you know a bell would ring when they saw this So they put this episode out and not only the host, but investigators were genuinely shocked when they got nothing, not a single, like there were a couple tips that came in, but not a single one was useful. Every single Mm. one was a dead end. And they thought, you know what, forget it. 
we're going to abandon this case. This was around midsummer 2001. So only like six, seven months later, they were like, you know what? This is going nowhere. So for two years, Darius's loved ones were left to wonder what happened and basically told, were told, well, we'll probably never find out. So 2003 comes around. Sorry, my nose. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's the full body contorting. <laughs> it's so gross i'm so glad this microphone has a mute button it's like Everybody. it's like the extras because you do this and then you do this you go <laughs> it's because i don't want you to see me but it probably looks like i'm having like a fit yeah. um i'm sorry everyone my nose i have like really bad allergies now that um it's springtime and i think that uh I'm trying to spare everyone from my nose blowing, but poor M has to like, I mute my microphone, but then my body just somehow reenacts it, everything. I, <laughs> if you just sat still, I wouldn't care as much, but because of the amount you're moving, I <laughs> kind of want to hear what's going on. You know? I know it's like a sick fascination. Like I can't look away. What is going on over there? It's like a train wreck. Yeah. It just... is a train wreck. Yeah, it is a train wreck. Um, So I apologize. Uh, If there are kind of breaks like that, folks, it's probably because I'm blowing my nose and I do apologize. Um, I'm just trying not to sound too stuffy. Anyway, okay, so they, two years go by, right? So in 2003, police begin a routine review of open and cold cases. Um, basically, mm. they do this in a lot of places around the world, just kind of open up some old cases, get some fresh eyes, see if anyone can, like, I don't know, That's catch smart. anything. Yeah, I think so. It's like it's like do, like doing a literal puzzle and having people come and check the, the pieces and see if yes, they can it's, spot it's anything It's like taking else. stepping away, right? And then like having somebody else come in and take a look. Exactly. It's fresh eyes. And thankfully, this actually worked. So the new detective who came in and took a look at these details, he reviewed all the documents and noticed something that he found a bit strange. What he found out is that Darius had taken several calls on a mobile phone, on a cell phone, the day he disappeared. The caller had originally contacted his office where his mother actually worked as a receptionist. And his mother said that when this caller had called the office, he seemed angry and impatient. He demanded to talk to Darius himself. So she mm. gave him Darius's cell phone number. And then presumably Darius received several calls from this phone number. So police determined that the calls had come from a phone booth near Darius's workplace, near his business. Today, you know, a cell phone might be like an obvious part of a case. But back then, uh, you know, cell phones were not as common in 2000. And the fact that this had kind of been um, glossed over uh, was... A sign of the a, times also. A sign of the times. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, that doesn't seem relevant. But like nowadays, of course, if a cell phone is involved, it's like, oh, we have to track every call and see who texted whom and what have you. So when they determined that the cell phone calls had been uh, received from a f from a pay phone uh, or a phone booth, they were able to do a little more digging. So, of course, now that there is this uh, cell phone involved, the detective is like, well, let's see if we can figure out anything specific about it. And it had never been accounted for during the investigation. And, of course, they thought, well, maybe, I mean, odds are it ended up at the bottom of the river. But when divers had kind of scoured the river, they hadn't found it. So they thought, well, there's still a chance that this cell phone is out there somewhere. So anything might have happened to it at this point, but especially because it's been like three years, right? But its absence was the first clue for the case in years because they knew he had a cell phone, but they had never found it and it had mm -hmm. never been accounted for. So there's like a little gap they wanted to fill in. So this investigator who noticed it decided to pursue it. He contacted Darius's wife, who incredibly still had the printed receipt for the phone's oh. original purpose. Oh my God. Yeah. And you know wow. how that's, that's on not throwing anything away. That's, that's me. You know that's what? Me. That's right. That's, that's how Christine's going to save the world. <laughs> that's how, that's not how me. I operate. <laughs> I throw things away the second I don't see a use to them at all. Couldn't be him. Um, I'm like, well, what if someone gets murdered and I need this? Like, that's how my brain works, which is. And sadly, sickness. part of me is like, that's a great point. That's it's, a it's really good point. Sickeningly, unfortunately, sometimes the case, like right now. The receipt showed the phone's IMEI number, which if anybody knows, that's basically just a tracking number for the specific phone. Um, and so it would show 
where it would be able to track the phone if it were still in use. So investigators obviously assume that whoever had killed Darius would have destroyed the phone long ago. So when they looked up this IMEI number, they were shocked to see that the phone was still in use. Oh, shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would have thought for sure. I was like, why even look? The why would you gone. even bother? Exactly. However, but then again, if you think about it, 2000, people didn't really know that, mm. a fo- you know what I mean? Like probably whoever did it didn't know like necessarily that this phone would be such a big clue for the police they yeah, probably just, just thought like, like oh, oh here's a cares? trophy of yes, my kill it's just it's just a piece of junk or whatever so actually uh someone had used the day they looked it up they found out someone had used it to make a call that day so it was very much still in use so they tracked oh down the phone's current owner and they learned that since darius's death you know three ish years earlier it had actually been bought and sold several times <gasps> so, yeah Ew, it's that's the same thought of like could you wear a serial killer shirt yeah. it's like yes. could you to know that i've been texting like my face has been pressed against Oof. the fu- like the face of somebody else who yeah ugh. who is so brutally murdered it is a dark thought so this poor guy or person who has the phone now is like what i just bought it from somebody you know they they have no clue and so they rule this person out as a suspect and they begin moving back to see who sold it to whom To whom, to whom. Mm -hmm. So one by one, the phone's previous owners were crossed off the list. And one of the detectives later said that it was their job to, quote, become the devil's advocate and try to look for any element that would prove a suspect's innocence. So every time they got to a new person who, like, had had owned the phone at some point or had sold the phone, they had to basically rule them out as a suspect. They wanted to find a lead, but they wanted to make sure that they were going tracing it all the way back to the person who had taken the phone from Darius to begin with. So finally, they did. They got to the end of the line. It turns out a businessman had bought the phone on an online auction only days after Darius was killed. So they were able to track all the way to the actual Internet post where that's this crazy phone isn't it where the phone had been sold only days after and so they knew whoever had sold this phone only days later probably is the one who had something to do with it or at least had some connection mm-hmm. and the user who had sold the device was called chris b7 okay. and chris b7 had sold the phone for roughly 80 bucks so basically to answer your question or not a question, but when you said like, oh, it's just a trophy or whatever, he basically was like, I could just get a couple bucks off this, right? Like this is right. just, yeah. I just, just sell like, it oh, here's some thinking. junk I need to get rid of. Exactly. And I'm, I'm, it's, use, it's, it's worth something. I might as well get money for it. Mm-hmm. So as far as they could tell, this seller, Chris B7, would have been the first person to own the phone after Darius's death, which is pretty telling. And when they looked into it, uh, they found out that the account, Chris B7, belonged to 30-year-old Christian Bala. They soon discovered that Christian was an author who used a blog to promote his book. His book, Em. Oh, boy. His book. You know when men think they're (laughs) really, really really deep? Right. He wrote. Did I tell you? A, I told you about that insufferable guy. The, that's from... yes, you did. Yeah. Okay. You so should maybe be friends. Maybe. Maybe, but probably not because I don't want to equate that person to a. Oh, this is for sure the guy. killer. Okay, got it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it sure is. Yeah. So let's. Yeah, we're, we'll uh, we'll 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 nix that connection. Um, but this this fucking guy, he had written a book. Okay, it was a lurid first person novel told from the point of view of a man named chris now this guy's name is christian k-r-y-s-t-i-a-n but the main character of the book is chris c-h-r-i-s so he's basically using like he he fooled us right like the americanized version of his own name as the uh which is also interestingly the name of the user chris b7 is spelled with a ch as well so he used the English version of his own name and the same name he used on the auction website. And the story followed Chris, this character, as he murdered a woman, which he described in this like lurid, like lustful sexual way of like a passion murder- kind of thing. Yeah. Well, just like he just wrote it in these really graphic details, like just oh. very uh, unpleasant and and 
fucked up. So the book apparently straddled the line between murder and sex, and investigators said there was, quote, not a great deal of plot, which I love. Uh, However, one point that did stick out to them was the fact that the narrator had sold a murder weapon on an online auction site. And they were like, well, that seems a little familiar and a little on the nose. Did it say, like, really used in a murder? Like, like, what did the the post say? Oh, the post just said, oh, yeah. the post was just uh, uh, selling a cell phone. I don't think there was any information on the post about where the cell phone. Okay. Didn't know if it was like he was really into like giving people a story with this. No, item. I think in the book he sold, I think, the knife that was used in the murder on the Internet. Okay. But in the in real life, it was the cell phone of the of the victim. Um, And so additionally, interestingly enough, the narrator also used rope to bind his victim before the killing. And, you know, the murder in the book was by no means like a one to one comparison. It wasn't like exactly word for word what had happened to Darius. And while, of course, it was a red flag that the first person to use and sell the phone after the killing also published a murder novel starring a protagonist with the same name, um, it wasn't like evidence that Mm -hmm. he was a real life murderer it was just an odd i guess it's evidence in the way of uh it's evidence but it's not like full or uh what's the word damning Uh, evidence (laughs) it's not damning evidence yeah sure it's no smoking gun so to speak so plenty of authors you know write about things they would never do in real life obviously so all you have to say is this is fiction and you know there you have it But a criminal psychologist who was brought onto the case to analyze this character, Chris, in the book for similarities to Christian acknowledged that there were quite a few similarities. But again, like if you're writing a book, you write it based on your own point of view. And uh, it it, it would make sense that the main character has a lot of similar traits. Mm -hmm. Still, the investigators felt like this was something. This was a lead. They were compelled by this book and above all by the fact that Christian still seemed to be the first person to have the phone. So at the very least, they wanted to know how the fuck he got his hands on that phone. Yeah. So the issue was they couldn't find him. Curiouser. Curiouser and curiouser. Christian had actually left Poland several years ago, only months after the killing. How convenient. And they absolutely did not have enough evidence to pursue him internationally, right? Like, they didn't have the jurisdiction to, like, track him down. And so instead, they decided to just wait. They were like, you know what? We're going to wait and see if he comes back. And, of course, he did because they always come back. Christian's passport was flagged in 2005 when he arrived at Polish Customs coming from outside the country. The ball's on this guy to, like, fly back into the country. And You would think if you escaped the country in time to not get caught, you have to imagine while I was gone, they came up with some leads and maybe yeah, I shouldn't you'd like You'd think back. so. You'd think so. And, I mean... Yeah. Okay. I was going to go on another rant about how sensational he thought he was, but well, I guess with the media saying, oh, this was uh, the perfect crime. He probably was like, yeah, it was a perfect crime, you know, probably got in his head. Um, And what's more is they had never talked to his family because they didn't want to tip him off. So they never told his family and friends like we're looking for him. Right. Because they were like, well, then he might never come back. So they just laid low. And they waited. And so when he did come back into the country and his passport was flagged, police collected him right away and brought him in for questioning. The weirdest part is that right off the bat, he confessed to the murder. And then Hmm. he panicked and he nearly fainted. And he said, I need medical attention. And he retracted his confession. And they were like, wait, wait, okay. He retracted the confession. So now he's saying, no, 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 I did not do that. I did not do anything. And so now the investigators, obviously the burden of proof falls on them. And this is a huge problem because they do not have anything to link Christian to Darius but this cell phone. And they had absolutely no motive that would have driven Christian to kill Darius so ruthlessly. So they held him for 48 hours, but then they were forced to release him because he had taken back his confession. Did he just try to say like it was like mental... Yeah, just had a mental breakdown or something? I don't think he even, I mean, as far as I know, we don't know, except he just apparently blurted out and then said, oh, never mind. What a, what a strange occurrence. I would be like. What an odd thing to just 
blurred out by mistake. Yeah. 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 But they couldn't do anything about it. They're like, well, technically he's saying he didn't do it. So they kept, even though they had to release him, they didn't give up. They began questioning people in his life and they would often bring up his novel, which by the way was called <laughs> Amok. A-M-O-K. M-A-O-K. A-M. A M O K, like run up to run amok. Oh, like like the thing that he's doing right now. Correct. Okay. So people begin. <laughs> you nailed it. <laughs> what are you a literary critic? Jeez. I mean, I do. I I did read a lot of poetry in my time, and by in my time, I I meant by since this morning. So. <laughs> I was gonna say last night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so also children's poetry. Children's but still, rhyming, yeah. but really, is it children's after everything we just learned? Great point. Very mature content. Yeah. Thank you. So people began to believe that Christian was being, this is eye roll worthy, persecuted for his artistic expression. And in the, okay. I know. I, I don't I even have it, it in me. I know. You're, you started to roll your eyes and then you just closed them. And I was like, is this <laughs> re- the part where you fall asleep? Because you're just over it. <laughs> it sounds like I could fall asleep right now and then wake up in a little bit and still be caught up. So, and it'll um, still be happening. Yeah, probably. I'll still be hearing about this fucking book. So This fucking book. So it apparently had a lot of anti-Catholic rhetoric, speaking of <laughs> nursery rhymes. I know, which, wow. Christian's like supporters and friends thought like, you know what, this is a Catholic country, Poland. And so they're just authorities are just offended that this is a Catholic, you know, they're calling out Catholicism. And Mm. so he's just being persecuted. And that's a bunch of bullshit. But anyway, Christian loved this new theory. And he began telling people that, oh, I'm the victim. They violently arrested me and they had attacked me, even though there's no proof of any of that. Um, a woman that he was seeing actually launched her own defense campaign on his behalf and people like joined wow. forces to support him and yeah, yeah. And be like, he, he wrote a piece of fiction and now he's being persecuted. You know, they spun it as like that angle. So I, I pretty love, quickly, Leonard, I mean, I hate, I hate, but I love when people try to claim being a victim, like mm-hmm. as they're doing the things they're doing. Especially anyway. when you so blatantly have a real victim. Like, yeah, like couldn't hmm. have a more literal victim. Yeah. Literal victim, yeah. So letters start coming into the Polish Justice Ministry from around the world demanding that they look into this case, which was targeting a man for writing fiction. Um, and this, of course, unfortunately, this book started flying off the shelves and was mm. an overnight bestseller. And I'm sure Christian thought he was the next. The second coming, you know. Mm-hmm. So the public began to speak more and more out, or speak out more and more, excuse me, against the case, believing like the police were harassing an innocent man. Um, and while police did not technically have the evidence um, to make an official arrest, they believed that they just had to find a motive and they could break this case wide open. Wide open. Wide open. So the lead investigator believed in his gut that jealousy was the motive behind the killing. He had Mm. spent hours and hours reading and analyzing Christian's book to try and understand Christian's point of view on murder and how his mind worked, which is so fascinating (sighs) to me. So he took away from the book a theme of acute jealousy. And he thought to himself, I think whoever wrote this fucking book has a, has a problem with jealousy and he suspected that this killer would play a role in uncovering the motive in the real life killing of Darius. So he just needed to find out why Christian was so jealous and how Christian even knew Darius in the first place. Meanwhile, Christian underwent psychiatric evaluations and was found to have very, this is in quotes, very specific sociopathic behavior. So, very specific. Very oh, God. specific sociopathic behavior. So All right. they're, they're like zeroed in on this guy. Uh, apparently, going back through his history, this shouldn't be that surprising to us now, but he liked to think he was smarter than everyone else all through his life. As a child, for example, <laughs> I know you're, you're, sh- you're shocked. <laughs> As a child, he was a star pupil. He was well-behaved. He didn't have any, like, behavioral issues. He initially went to college for philosophy and wanted uh, to create a career in academia. He was very popular among his professors and peers. They thought he was studious, intelligent, funny, and 
just someone fun to have around. However, he also had a reputation as a womanizer. But on that front, women loved him. He was able to pick up whoever he wanted and get rid of them just as easily. He Apparently often so. Told, yeah. He often told his friends, I will not live long, but I will live furiously. With Whoa. And in any other circumstance, I, I might find that charming, but not this one. <laughs> So in 1995, Christian was 23, and he married his childhood sweetheart, Stanislava, who went by Stacia, and they had a son together. So he seemed to have it all. He had this, like, career. He had a classic, like, lifelong romance. He had a loving family, a, a son on the way. He was confident, intelligent, popular. He was attractive. But the people who knew him also noticed some cracks in his veneer. He was enrolled in this PhD program at school, but because of his new and young family, he kind of had to move away from getting his PhD, even though that was his dream, because mm. he had to support his family. So he expected Stacia to be a stay-at-home mother and housewife, so he thought, I have to support the family. I'm going to quit school and open a business. And he told people he could do anything he wanted, and he really believed that. He believed he had a superior Oof. intellect. Uh, but unfortunately for him, Christian had no sense for business. Uh, he apparently never invested any of his profits back into the business. And so very quickly, he had to file for bankruptcy. And so that was a big fail. Uh, but of course, to him, that was not his failure. That was a failure on the part of everybody else around him. Of course. You know, of course. You know, he's that the kind victim. of guy. He is the victim, exactly. So um, He was also extremely confrontational, had a very short temper, and he was a serial cheater. He had tons of affairs and then he would project them which we see sometimes back onto stacia and he would accuse her of being the unfaithful one of course he was also a liar and he lied so often that sometimes he believed his own lies and just kind of lived in this like pathological fantasy land he also made up stories about his life to seem more impressive and he would roll with them until he had almost convinced himself that these stories about himself were true he followed his wife to a bar once, and then when he arrived, he publicly accused her of cheating and then threatened to kill the men she was supposedly seeing behind his back. He just wanted a reason to be violent. That was it. I agree with you. I yeah. agree with you 100%. And eventually, he was so fed up with this alleged cheating that she probably wasn't even doing that he simply forced her to stay home at all times. He basically just trapped her at home. Wow. And when she couldn't stand it anymore, she divorced him. But Christian refused to just leave her alone and let her go. He became obsessive. He stalked her. He did whatever he could to keep control over her. Yuck. And then one day, she met a man named Darius Janachewski. Oh, I fucking knew there was a girl involved. You did. You sure it's did. It's like there's no, this never happens to just a man, which like no. it does, but not. We've done enough of these where I'm like, uh, there's got to be... You know the dynamic. I know the a common dynamic. And a yeah, common like, dynamic. Where the hell is the woman? Here she is. Totally innocent, but somehow roped into all this nonsense, which yep. is how it goes. So, of course, she and Darius hit it off. But when Stacia learns that Darius is married, by the way, remember, he's in a happy marriage and adopting uh -oh. a son soon. She's like, no, no, no. I'm calling the, I'm calling this off before anything happens. Because she knew all too well what it was like to be the wife of someone having an affair. And she said, I'm not going to be involved in that. So soon afterward, Darius seemed to kind of mend his relationship with his wife. And he was no longer pursuing extramarital affairs. And Stacia was out of the picture. It was a very brief, just a brief, they got to know each other. Then they Fleeting. parted ways. Fleeting. Yes. But Christian, the stalker, had already found out about Darius, and he could not let it go. It seemed that investigators' suspicions were correct. The motive was jealousy. And when the case went to trial, finally, it became a media frenzy throughout Europe. The, the news outlets just loved the, the hook of a murderer writing about killing and then doing the killing. I mean, it's, it's an outlandish story. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. uh, what do you call it? True, true, the stranger than fiction. Um, and like I said, this novel becomes an overnight bestseller. People are just fascinated by this. But the court decided during the trial that the book itself was not going to be admissible as evidence. And the prosecution agreed. They were like, you know what? This 
this is just going to distract the jury from from the case at hand. But Christian wanted to talk about it. He believed he was only on tri- well, I don't know if he believed it, but he liked to say he was only on trial because he had written this book and that he was an artist being persecuted for writing fiction, you know, all that bullshit. So he kept trying to bring it up and he was like mocking the investigation on the stand. And finally, the judge was like, we are not here to talk about your book. We're here to talk about this real crime that happened. And so despite Christian's assumptions, they did have some compelling evidence. And that was the phone calls made to Darius's cell phone just before he went missing. Oh, shit. So they he didn't had, know about that this whole time? He did not know about that. Hmm. They kn- he knew that they had tracked his phone down, the cell phone okay. at least, that he had stolen. Um, but then they said, hey, we know that this phone came from a phone booth, but what's more, we know that the caller had used a phone card to operate the phone, and that same phone card had been used to make phone calls to Christian's parents, colleagues, and friends. Mm, okay. Ding, ding, ding. Who's the common denominator? So... Christian continued to testify that he never met Darius, never even heard of him. But a friend of Christian's ex-wife told a different story. She said, well, Christian had actually come and asked her about Darius, and he had a lot of questions. Where did Darius work? What did he do? Hey, if I want to meet Darius, where can I find him? And this Mm -hmm. woman was like, dude, I'm not getting involved in this. Finally, investigators had searched for evidence at Christian's parents' house, and it had been five years since the murder, so they thought they will probably won't find anything. But like you alluded to earlier, M, he had kept some mementos from his crime. <sighs> Dummy. Okay. He had taken a pen and a business card from Darius's company, proving at the very least that it was a lie that he had no idea who Darius was. Right, right, right. What's more, he also kept a notebook about Darius and listed out all the things he knew about him. Are you fucking kidding me? That's like, <laughs> so he, now that's the smoking gun. That one right it's there. It's like 10 things I know about Darius. And it's like 10 never ways met- I plan on hurting Darius because well, I'm yes. jealous and don't like him. Yeah, I'm jealous and I don't like him. I, really, that is exactly how it went. They found this. No- He's like, I've never heard of the guy. And they're like, well, why do we have a notebook where you write down all the things that you know about this guy? Yeah, nice try. Exactly. Nice try, guy. Police also found evidence on Christian's computer that he was stalking Stacia's new boyfriend. Uh oh, and he had typed notes on the man as well, just like his notebook Come on, on Darius. And the notes on the new man that she was with said, "Single, thirty-four years old. His mom died when he was eight. Apparently works at the railway company, probably as a train driver, but I'm not sure. He's not even good at like being a PI. You know, like that's no." Big whoop. I could have figured that out. So when he found out that this new boyfriend, Harry, uh, was in a particular online chat room, he actually made an account, joined the chat room, and posted, Sorry to bother you, but I'm looking for Harry. Does anyone know him? (laughs) Okay. Yeah. So he's like the least subtle guy ever. And finally, one of Christian's own friends testified against him, telling the court that just weeks after the murder, they were out with Christian when he began bragging about how much control he had over his ex-wife's life. He told his friend that he had killed one of her lovers with a rope. Bad. 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 And basically, when this was announced at trial, it was the final nail in the coffin for his defense team he had undone his own case with all his overconfidence all his bullshit thinking he was smarter than everybody investigators believed he simply overestimated himself and his intelligence he thought he was untouchable he thought he was too smart and of course looking back if he had not sold the phone if he had just tossed it in the river he probably never would have gotten caught because they wouldn't have isn't that crazy that all it was one and thing. like he was trying to get rid of it too, just exactly, exactly. He just way. wanted the extra eighty bucks off it, which is like mm-hmm. moron. So yeah, he probably would never. They probably would have never even gotten his name, let alone like that he had anything to do with this murder. However, some experts who evaluated Christian believed he sold the phone intentionally to get some sort of compensation from Darius. Like, oh, he owes me this last Ugh. thing. Even though he had taken his life, some psychiatrists who, who studied, not studied him, but like, you know, had appointments with him 
basically determined that this was more motivated. His selling the phone was more motivated by like, now for my final act, I get some cash yeah. out of this deal. And either way, he felt entitled to everything he could take beyond Darius's life, even believe it or not. And despite that, you know, if he had never even returned to Poland, he probably would have been completely free for the rest of his life. But in yeah. his mind, he just was easy breezy. And as far as he was aware, he had gotten away with what reporters were calling the perfect crime. So in September of 2007, Christian was sentenced to 25 years in prison, which is the minimum term for life imprisonment in Poland. Um, the death penalty is outlawed there. And despite the evidence and the conviction, of course, Christian continues to maintain his innocence. Woe is me. In yeah, an interview, he I said, don't care. I don't care. In an interview, he said, they have ruined my personal life, my professional life, my family life. For what? For nothing. Okay. Oh, my God. He also told David Gran of The New Yorker, I am being sentenced to prison for 25 years for writing a book. For writing a book. Idiot. And that is a story of Christian Bala. I let, you know, it makes me happy. I think that was the first time you've ever ended a story with the last word being idiot. <laughs> <laughs> that was a good it's way to end true. it. It's we should very check the transcript. We should check the transcripts because somehow I don't, I, I feel like there must have been another idiot somewhere out there that I shouted if you at the end. If you check the uh, transcript you'll actually see that i wrote it in red pen at the bottom just <laughs> on all my notes out. just my story you just wrote or the idiot stenographer just like kept writing idiot without anyone like asking about that it's possible um or oh, the ai chat bot that does the transcriptions was like idiot <laughs> <laughs> oh the privilege it's disgusting it's and the disgusting. narcissism and the desperation to be a victim and the complete lack of awareness of their part in the responsibility yep. or their lack of empathy i mean the list goes on you can even see it with like when his business fails and he's like everybody made my business fail you know it's like wow this guy is n no clue i was so out of touch i was just watching um tiktoks about narcissism and there's uh one of them is called the the vulnerable narcissist where it's like uh -huh. every it's like oh i couldn't do this because everyone else was in my way and everyone was taking this from me and everyone bothered me and everyone totally. it's everyone it's, else's it, fault not me shifting the blame always yeah yes yes um so apparently that's a very specific type of narcissist well remember they said he's a specific type of sociopath oh yeah okay hey maybe we're onto something there uh-huh wow well good story christine that was um i feel like uh that was one of your shorter ones but it was still jam-packed yeah, it was a it was a doozy. I feel like the last story I did was like ten pages, and this one was eight, so it's still pretty long. Um, but how do you feel when you see your notes and they're like a certain length? Is there a certain length where you go, "Oh boy, that's going to be a long one"? Yeah, it's like anything over five and a half. <laughs> really? Because that, yeah. that okay, wow. Five, see, five for and me, a half. I'm like, this is pretty short. What is the font size? Dare I ask? Um, I believe it's eleven Arial. Mine's eight aerial, so if mine yep. goes over a page and a half, I have a problem. You're a lunatic with your with your size. Be, I zoom in to be fair, so it never looks like it's eight. Okay, okay, okay. What? Okay, but you want? Oh, you do it small so it fits on the page. Gotcha. Okay. I have a I have a certain in eight point font. If it's over a page and a half, I get really nervous. Yeah, it's so it's, just, it's more just to see like the 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 amount of. It's more about the minutes. Well, yeah, and then when it's so small, it looks like just like a big block of text. That's very intimidating. It is until you zoom in, and then it just looks like as. And big then it as says, "Like be. fun fact, Miss Mary Mac was about had, Bloody Mary." Actually, she actually had buttons all down her back. Um, wow, I mean, <laughs> listen, that could have been about Bloody Mary too. I'm just saying, it could have been. I wonder about Miss Mary Mac in a lot of Love ways. It. Like, is she doing okay? I think about her all the time. <laughs> I do too. I was like, did she ever change her wardrobe or like? Is she just going to keep cycling the same dress over and over? I mean, silver buttons. Like, why would you go? You can't go wrong. Until we're back in our, a gold era. Mm. She probably heard about rose gold and got real nervous. I think we all heard about rose gold and got real nervous. <laughs> probably so. <laughs> what Did you have a favorite uh, playground chant? And, I mean, that was probably it. Miss Mary Mac? Oh, no, no, no. What's the one? Um, This one patty cake no no the we did it in an after hours once um 
Hmm. Maybe that is it. Patty cake? No, no, Miss Mary Mac. What's the one where she like goes to the movies and unbuttons her flies and or whatever? Oh, oh, the the one where like every last part yeah, of yeah, it yeah. feels like you're gonna cuss, but then it's not. Mm-hmm. That's my favorite. Um, what is wrong with me? Uh, here mm-hmm, I'll say a line. Mm-hmm, the boys mm-hmm. in the bat. The bo- The boys are in the. Uh, yipping up their flies are in the meadow the bees yeah. are in the park miss Susie and her boyfriend are kissing in the dark 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 and then remember we were doing it in the after hours and you were getting so fed up because every time it stopped and then i just kept going because like i just kept adding verses you were not having an enjoyable experience see it's why i don't want to encourage you with your rhyming abilities because i'm like you could just start <laughs> freestyling and then it never ends <laughs> ever uh well if uh you want to hear us I guess freestyle more limericks. Uh, you can head over to our Patreon with our after hours and uh, and see what we're about over there. I think we're going to do a ghost test, okay. ghost quiz. Thank you for remembering. I'm actually going to do a what type of ghost are you quiz today. I know Christine's going to be a poltergeist without a question. <laughs> um, uh, but if you would like to find out what I'm going to be, head on over to Patreon. Great idea. And that's why we drink. <laughs>